Address Gazprom's supply and demand model for Eurasia. Examine company policies and engagement strategies in former Soviet space and in Europe. We also have Mr. John Loft. John is the Associate Fellow of Russia and Eurasia programs at Chatham House. John is um, he's a Managing Director of JBKL Advisory Limited. He's an expert on Russian international relations, especially as they concern oil and gas sector. He worked as International Affairs Advisor at TNK BP from 2003 to 2008, an information representative from Central Eastern Central and East European at the NATO Office of Information Press from 98 to 2001. Dr. Edward Lemon, he is a um, DMGS Kennan Institute Fellow of the Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Uh, he is, uh, his research focuses on authoritarian governance, religion, security, and mitigation, migration in Eurasia since 2009. Dr. Lemon has spent approximately three years combined conducting field work in Tajikistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Poland. And, Dr. and Mr. Neil Barnett, he's the chief executive of Istok Associates Limited, he's, which is a risk consultancy that specializes in Central and East European and Middle East issues. And prior to that, he was a journalist in Central and Eastern Europe and the Middle East with 15 years experience. He's written for The Telegraph, The Spectator, and The Guardian, and covered both the 2004 Orange Revolution in Ukraine and the conflict in Iraq. So why don't I begin, Melissa, I'll turn over to you first. Okay. Um, okay. I, I thought we might start um, the other end, but I can, I will oh. talk, I, I'm happy I will to probably begin the other speak end. That... very briefly. Okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk a bit about um, some research that I, I had done focusing on Russia's use of NGOs, foundations, think tanks, um, the development of um, what I would call shadow institutions or what Alex Cooley has called zombie NGOs. Um, and I think that the, the difficulty or the, or the problem of um, having these institutions is that they aim to create an infrastructure that replicates rule of law with an, a different set of rules. And from my position as a, a human rights worker, it also aims to create a new set of human rights, um, rights that are limited and don't apply to everyone um, because they are hierarchical. And certain rights trump other rights. Um, and so I see this happening at so many different levels. Um, you know, many have spoken about the regional bodies of the Eurasian Economic Union or the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement and the treaties that they create among themselves or the uh, blacklist list that lists that they create that sort of mimic Interpol lists and the fact that a bunch of um, authoritarian countries can then agree on who the blacklisted individuals are can then give credence to um, the definitions of, you know, what is uh, a security risk when that person may just be a human rights defender who is um, raising issues of concern. Um, but I also see this in the development of actual organizations and foundations, small media outlets um, that are created to put out disinformation, gongos. Um, Free Russia Foundation put out, I think, an excellent piece that described the rise in gongos. Um, including from Russia where you have you know, government organized NGOs um, that have gone from 20 in 2009 up to about 49 appearing at the OSCE um, major human rights conference in 2018. Um, and then you also have more grassroots type uh, organizations that may indicate that they are um, representing the rights of individuals but again they put out reports um, that are sourced from um, non-scientific uh, uh, resources that describe problems such as um, the migrant crisis as drawing attention away from uh, certain communities, Russian communities that have existed in Europe for long periods of time. And then you also have cultural groups, um, religious groups, you're seeing in the Balkans um, a much coordinating between the Russian Orthodox Church and the, and the Serbian Orthodox Church, for example, 
um, and then the also, also the use of religious institutions for other purposes. Um, witness the creation or the building of a cathedral in France that is very close to um, the general defense uh, location. So how are these organizations funded and why are they a rule of law concern? Um, they're generally funded in very non-transparent ways um, through chains of mediators so that the money comes through so many different circles that it's hard to tell where it actually is coming from, usually through tax havens. Shell companies, Senator White House mentioned, are a, a major problem here. Um, and a number of non-transparent <laughs> non transfers. So often you will see oligarchs, um, you know, very rich people developing their own foundation, and then the funding from that foundation comes from Shell Company 1, Shell Company 2, Shell Company 3, and if you follow the, fund, the ownership of those companies, it will go back to friend of oligarch, wife of oligarch, ex-wife of oligarch that are all coming to this one um, uh, NGO. And then, of course, you also see uh, funding coming directly from the state. So the Russian state also funds a number of organizations that, um, that deem themselves NGOs and foundations. Um, what do they do? They lobby against specific policies, for example, in the EU, there are a number of NGOs <coughs> that receive Russian funding that lobby against shale gas exploration in the EU. Um, they spread disinformation, you know, such as false narratives um, about uh, NATO, for example, trying to um, disparage NATO and say that it can't actually um, protect security or that it is just a the U.S. using other countries for its own security so that, you know, North Macedonia shouldn't want to be part of NATO. Um, and then it can also gather intelligence. Um, so I already mentioned the Orthodox Church in France that has been a suspect for gathering intelligence, but you also see the Humanitarian Relief Center created in Serbia um, that was uh, said to be, an, uh, that the U.S. intelligence community reported as an espionage operation, or the Russian Center for Science and Culture that was investigated here in the two, in, D.C. in 2013 um, because it was taking staffers on trips and then trying to uh, make them intelligence assets. Um, and then they also have been used to launder money. Um, so Faris Kunin's payments uh, to Edgar Savisar through an NGO in Estonia were the, the facts that provided the basis for investigation into Savisar's <coughs> uh, acceptance of bribes. Um, and he was eventually convicted in 2015. Um, so I, the major concern that I want to raise about the creation of these foundations, um, you know, Baris Yakun has a number of them. Of them. Um, there are a number that are concerned with religious uh, affiliations and religious groups, is that they create counter norms. Um, and so this is the shadow development of norms that I referenced in the beginning. Um, for example, you see a number of these organizations observing elections. Um, and they are there to observe that the election existed, but they are not there to uh, certify that the election was free and fair under the OSCE um, requirements. And so you'll see, you know, this happened in Azerbaijan in 2013, where you had more than 40 organizations that were brand new observing the election and saying it was okay, when in fact um, the results of the election were announced the day before the election. Um, and then you have them arguing uh, for new concepts of human rights at the UN. This is the, the number of resolutions that have been introduced, um, including pushed by NGOs that say that a traditional values concept of rights should be considered um, and referenced more often um, in the UN. And that concept of rights, again, is hierarchical and says that certain rights, um, those of family members, for example, should trump other rights, the rights of LGBTQ members and women. Um, there is also, uh, I'm, I referenced the use of treaties, again, you know, by groups like SEO to, uh, to mimic this structure of an international institution that has legitimacy. Uh, what, is, uh, what is contributing to the reshaping of these norms? I think one major factor is that the U.S. has withdrawn from uh, its participation in the world as a, 
maybe not an example always, but a cheerleader of these norms. Um, but that has also been the result of U.S. funding shrinking. Um, U.S. funding for civil society is going down. And at the same time, you see increases, great increases, in both China and Russia for soft power advances. Um, and that includes for things like foundations, things like cultural programming, and things like media. And so as U.S. funding goes down and this other funding goes up, you just see greater influence happening in the world. Um, and I think that's both with funding, with uh, you know, financial support for NGOs, but also for media. So what can we do? Um, I think that it's important that those U.S. voices that can continue to reinforce the real um, standards of human rights and real standards of rule of law, that we continue to reference them. That's what gives them power. Um, that diplomats continue to reference them and raise them. I think diplomats sometimes think that they should not uh, talk about human rights because it will make people uncomfortable, but I think that's what gives them power and raising particular issues and particular standards can be uh, very important. Um, increase funding for civil society, of course, um, and give awards and recognition to individual civil society members that are combating these um, misuses of rule of law. And then increase transparency. When I talk about uh, NGOs, uh, I talked about the shell companies that fund them, and those shell companies should have to report uh, their beneficial ownership. I know that's something that has been introduced in both the Senate and the House now in the U.S., and so I think that we should be pushing for legislation like that. And then I'd also <coughs> like to see a reform of the, freedom, uh, the Foreign Agent Registration Act. Um, the, currently, there is a push to uh, enforce FARA, but there is not an examination of what it actually says. Its language is very squishy. And so, as a lawyer, I would like to see the definitions become more legal if we're going to increase enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think the last point on FARA is, is really significant and difficult for us to deal with right now. Ilya, why don't I turn to you next for remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for coming this morning uh, for this uh, timely report. Uh, I've been studying uh, cryptocracy and Russian expert of corruption for over uh, for about a decade now and uh, i think uh, um, i'll make some general remarks uh, uh, on the timing of the uh, study and then very quickly we'll go over a few specific cases um, today it was mentioned that uh, russia is a weak economy with uh, aging population and definitely not as strong as in terms of arms and uh, uh, global projection as Soviet Union used to be, but I think it's not time to relax. Uh, in fact, uh, I see uh, the trend that Russian kleptocracy, along with other Eurasian kleptocracies, are getting bolder and more sophisticated in terms of undermining Western institutions and values. And if initially, um, in late 90s, in early 2000s, we saw them just uh, uh, corrupting their own country or corrupting neighbors, uh, looting, um, you know, Soviet uh, plants, uh, 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 undermining a nascent market economy, and just taking money to the West and buying yachts and real estate. Uh, over the last two decades, uh, <coughs> kleptocrats, uh, especially from Putin's uh, inner circle, but also in, from the broader network, learned um, more sophisticated ways. They hired uh, lobbyists, lawyers, uh, various consultants who, uh, uh, in the West who advise them how to uh, game the system and how to apply both legal processes and illegal processes when, when necessary for their own advantage. And they do it not only uh, for their <coughs> the, the system works in a funny way uh, in that when uh, necessary um, they do, do it just for their own advantage but because they have such they are on the hook in their own country, and Kremlin has leverage over them. Uh, the leadership in the Kremlin can actually uh, uh, use many of the uh, people who, move, who supposedly move to the West for good. They can uh, use them on ad hoc basis and um, apply uh, them for their own interests. Uh, um, and so, as a, as a broad remark, I would say 
Yes, uh, Russian economy is just two trillion dollars, but uh, we estimate that at least around a trillion dollars uh, has been stolen uh, from Russian people over the last two decades, and most of it stashed by Putin and his circle uh, in Western um, accounts, in offshore accounts. And um, when Putin sees uh, Putin and his people see Western leaders, they uh, are. They see themselves wealthier than these Western leaders, especially Putin himself, but uh, who is arguably the wealthiest person in the world. Uh, they see that they are not going away anywhere soon. Putin is going to stay in power, as I understand, he, he thinks he will stay in power for another at least uh, two terms, which now are seven years each. And um, he, he's okay to leave G8. Uh, he's, he feels much more comfortable in G20 and among other uh, not so liberal market uh, economy based uh, uh, countries like uh, China, Brazil, India, South Africa and I think uh, even though Russian economy is weak, they, Putin's circle believes that they can undermine uh, the shrinking Western liberal capitalism uh, with um, other Eurasian plutocracies um, and, and various autocrats. Um, and uh, our cases actually show that th this, this, all these trends, that this sophistication in learning Western legal processes, the, the boldness, the, applic the application of both legal and illegal uh, means when necessary. Uh, and so I will start with um, uh, a decade-long uh, process that took place in Spain, where uh, the local uh, police was probably the bold, uh, the the most uh, bold, uh, the boldest and most effective in trying to uh, be public about Russian mafia in Europe, in in trying to stop uh, penetration of um, uh, criminality uh, supported by Russian government. And actually, that's another uh, big revelation <coughs> compared to Soviet times. N uh, uh, never under Brezhnev or Andropov. Russian criminality felt such support from the government, I including in international uh, uh, processes uh, and interactions. And so, uh, very briefly, um, w what we saw in Spain is that there was a special uh, prosecutor who um, got authority to bug uh, these various networks to see how they laundered money in various uh, real estates and, and uh, businesses uh, he prepared a good case, and then uh, the, the, the Spanish legal system essentially needed him to cooperate with the Russian legal system. And Russian Minister of Justice uh, and law enforcement, they not only did not cooperate, but they did everything they could to protect the criminals. And um, many people were warned and left Spain uh, some were, uh, were allowed to leave Spain on very strange pretexts. Um, then this special prosecutor, Jose Grinde Gonzalez, uh, who actually came uh, uh, some time ago to Washington to Hudson Institute, uh, invited by uh, Cryptocracy Initiative of Charles uh, Davidson. Um, and uh, he, he is experienced enormous pressure himself, uh, uh, death threats, he has to stay under 24-7 um, uh, uh, protection, uh, ride in arm armored vehicles. Um, so uh, this prosecutor could not push this uh, case properly and uh, um, it, 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 it got protracted. Uh, then there were, uh, when he filed some new reports, uh, which included some Russian ministers and high level officials, the retaliation came in the form of him being uh, accused of, of being a pedophile. So Russians started to throw these dirt uh, in Spain uh, through, um, through, through, through the processes um, um, in media and in, in, in legal processes. So to cut a long story short, I, I very much advise you to, to read this story properly. Uh, last <coughs> October there was a trial and it, uh, the Spanish court mostly acquitted most of uh, most Russian uh, 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 suspects. Um, only secondary people got um, uh, accused, mainly from the Spanish side. 
even though the court agreed that their activity was very suspicious, at the end of the day, it relied on, strangely relied on uh, verdicts from Russian courts and Russian ministries and allowed many of these people to, to stay innocent. I'm pretty sure that Spanish prosecution will continue to fight, but um, uh, it's it's pretty astonishing case. Uh, another case is, um, uh, uh, another case, uh, how many minutes do I have? Just two minutes. Okay. Um, Another case that I want to mention is a Yuka's case. Um, uh, essentially, uh, for, former shareholders of Yuka's got uh, unprecedented decision from a special uh, 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 arbitration tribunal uh, in Holland that allowed them to uh, get compensation from the Russian state for the unlawful expropriation of the company. When they tried to do that in France and Spain uh, and the Belgium, uh, <laughs> Russian uh, government put enormous pressure on uh, the executive branches in France and Belgium, which in turn put the, uh, el el essentially allied with the Russian government and put their own pressure on uh, legislative and judicial branches in, in France and Belgium. Uh, they retroactively changed laws so that uh, UK shareholders would not be able to um, uh, get compensation. They uh, uh, even uh, you know, interfered in the judicial processes. For example, warned uh, the clerk uh, in Belgian court not to proceed with with the job that she was supposed to proceed with. Um, they um, uh, just just acted as allies of the, of the Russian government, which is uh, pretty unprecedented and very well detailed in our report. Um, then there was an incident where um, uh, American uh, law firm Baker Boards assisted Rosneft in uh, uh, a case in Armenia, which had impl uh, implications for uh, an asset uh, um, uh, registered in the Netherlands again. And so by gaming Armenian court on uh, an asset called Yuka CIS, uh, the, uh, the, there was an, uh, an attempt to influence Dutch courts as well. Um, and finally, um, the, uh, the, there is a question about integrity of professional uh, s service firms. Um, so uh, companies like uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers who did audit auditing for uh, UCAS before it, it was attacked, retract, uh, uh, retrospectively changed their audits under the pressure from Russian government. Uh, a company called uh, White and Case uh, confirmed that UCAS uh, prioritization was correct before it was attacked. Now it, this company works for Rosneft and it would not even release those documents um, to, to its uh, former client. Um, and there are other examples. So uh, this um, I want I, in Q and A. I will talk about more, um, about uh, further cases. But um, my final point is that this is not just about individual uh, corruption cases or judges, uh, but this is uh, a penetration into all different uh, uh, branches of uh, legal processes, from uh, uh, service companies, lawyers. Um, uh, 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 legislative and uh, judicial branches, media, uh, uh, f throwing dirt at opponents, um, and uh, assisting at the highest levels of government to, to, to criminals. Ilya, thank you very much. I think what we're already hearing is a trend of some potential gaps in, in Western laws and then where laws do exist elsewhere, the, uh, the misapplication of those laws. Um, John, why don't I turn to you next for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, congratulations to Natalia and the team on this very impressive and uh, timely publication. Uh, my contribution in some ways is, is rather modest, but I, I chose to highlight um, the shocking case of injustice involving a Russian family in Guatemala. I've been involved with this case for now just over four years. I believe it demonstrates not, not just the, the long arm of the, the Russian state, but it also shows how deeply it can penetrate a country which has weak institutions and no rule of law. 
I worked on several cases involving Russian business people who've, um, let's put it this way, have lost control of their assets in Russia and then been forced to flee, found themselves on the receiving end ultimately of uh, criminal proceedings in Russia, and then the Russian authorities have tried on the basis of those proceedings to get them back to, to Russia, and they tend to use then mutual legal assistance arrangements, uh, Interpol tools, um, criminal interests effectively in Russia are then dressed up in these clothes of internationally acceptable legal procedures that have analogues in rule of law countries and appear quite uh, respectable. And in lawyers call this the, the presumption of regularity. So when you, you, you get a request from the Russian prosecutor's office, you sort of assume that that m must be formulated on the same way as it would be in the, um, I don't know, in, in the equivalent in, in the United States or indeed in my country in Britain. But in the case of the, uh, the Bitkovs, the Bitkov family in Guatemala, I've never seen anything like this before. The, the reason is that the, this family has been pursued with extraordinary determination and energy. And the, the really distressing thing is that their innocent children have been targeted in the process. So let me split my presentation into two parts. I'll talk a little bit about what happened to the, the Bitkovs, and then I'll attempt to draw some conclusions from that. And let me say, firstly, I think the really remarkable thing about this case is how the Russian side has been able to get into the legal process in Guatemala, which has included co-opting the highly respected International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, which is known by its Spanish acronym CISIG. This is a powerful anti-corruption agency that operates under the aegis of the United Nations and it receives financial support from several Western countries, including the United States, which supplies about half its budget, Canada, Germany, Sweden, the UK, and uh, the European Union. So the story of the Bitkovs. Uh, Igor and Irina Bitkov were a young entrepreneurial couple who ran a successful paper-producing business in the northwest of Russia. As the Putin system became embedded in the the sort of mid uh, naughty years, they, they had a falling out with the new governor who'd been appointed there in the region where they had their, their main plant. They refused to donate to uh, United Russia, the ruling party, or get involved with it, and they backed their own uh, candidates in regional elections. And I think it's fair to say that revenge was swift. And the, the pressure initially came in the form of the kidnapping of their 16-year-old daughter, by a criminal gang that was working under the authority of the FSB in St. Petersburg. Um, absolutely terrible things happened to their daughter, uh, which left her, left her with lasting psychiatric, psychiatric damage. Her parents had to pay a ransom for her release. Then, despite an, imp an impeccable credit record, um, with the majority of the loans to their plants paid off, two state banks uh, called in their loans in 48 hours and took over the company. This is sort of classic corporate raid model. The Bitklovs fled to Europe. They were told to return and to, to, to pay a fee to settle their problem. Uh, they refused to do this, and they were then, they were then threatened. And they were basically told that uh, we, will, we will hunt you down, and if we, if we have to, we will kill you. That was the message that they understood. The, the banks that had stolen or taken over the, their business then accused them, the Bitklovs, of embezzling the loans. The loans were, um, were not repaid in full for the simple reason that the banks took over the business, but they had then assets which were the collateral for the loans in the first place. So there should have been no issue really around the, the repayment ultimately of those loans. But the structures affiliated with, the, with those banks sold the plants valuable equipment and in some cases for simply for scrap metal. So believing their lives were in danger and they would be hunted down, they responded uh, to an advertisement uh, by a Panama-based law firm that was offering citizenship uh, services in Guatemala. Uh, they saw no obvious connections with Russia, between Guatemala and Russia, and importantly, there was no extradition treaty between Russia and Guatemala. So through this law firm, they began the naturalization process. They learned Spanish. Uh, they quickly received their documents, and on the advice of the law firm, they took new identities. And I would say despite the trauma of losing their business in Russia um, and having to flee the country, they did, they did find new happiness. Uh, Irina Vitkova became pregnant and gave birth to a second child, a little boy uh, called Vladimir, who was born in 2012. They'd left Russia uh, in, what, in 2000, uh, 2009. 
They bought a house in a, a rather pleasant uh, gated community on the outskirts of Guatemala City and settled down. So it rather seemed as though they'd just got away. But they could not have been more mistaken because three years later, five o'clock in the morning in January, uh, January the 15th of 2015, uh, they were arrested, 70 armed police um, swooped on their, on their house, and it, it turned out that they'd been uh, arrested on a documents uh, charge. The documents they had were genuine, but they had been illegally issued. It turned out that there was a flourishing passport business in Guatemala that was operating with high-level patronage. So technically, they had committed an offence by using illegally issued documents. This is normally settled by a fine in, in Guatemala and then expulsion from the country. But the Bitcoins had an important legal argument that was to appear later, namely that under something called the Palermo Convention, they were migrants who did not have criminal liability, in this case, for possessing the documents that they had received. But the authorities accused them of being part of a criminal group issuing passports and not just its users. And an absolutely unspeakable nightmare followed. Um, An Anastasia, the daughter, had a nervous breakdown after five days in detention, held in an open cell underneath a parking, um, in a parking lot, up in a parking lot under the, underneath the main court building. I visited that place. It is absolutely horrendous. Under pressure from CSIG, the anti-corruption agency, the three-year-old little boy was put into an orphanage for 42 days before being returned to his guardians, and he returned in a really traumatized uh, state and in poor health. And after nearly three years in detention, the Bitkovs were tried as part of a criminal structure engaged in the issue of false documents. Uh, Igor Bitkov received a 19-year jail sentence. Yes, one nine, his wife and daughter, 14 years each. So of 5,000 people, roughly, who had received passports over a two-year period, the Bitkovs were the only ones to stand trial. So the prosecutors allege that, among other things, that they had manipulated data's, data in the systems of the National Registrations Agency, how they could have done this without speaking a word of Spanish on arrival in Guatemala when their applications were made, of course, is something that's uh, never, been, uh, never been answered. The real criminal structure in operation was never in investigated not least because one of the senior in, uh, officials in the public ministry that prosecuted the Bitkovs had actually personally been involved in the illegal passport business and had, in this case, signed off on Anastasia Bitkova's um, residence permit. And there is evidence that other senior officials were similarly implicated. Now, there is substantial evidence pointing to how the Russian side was able to enter this legal process um, related to the passports, and it, 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 it did so based on the false allegation that the Bitkovs had embezzled um, loans in Russia. It was able to recruit CSIC, the anti-corruption agency, to its cause, and um, the lawyers hired by the two Russian state banks, VTB and Gazprom Bank, uh, played a role in having the Bitkovs case made part of this broader investigation, or so-called investigation, <coughs> into the illegal passports uh, business. And this investigation only targeted low-level officials. One more minute. That's fine. Now, thanks to a powerful lobbying campaign spearheaded by Bill Browder, the, the, the big calls were uh, freed from prison a year ago and placed under, under house arrest. Now, let me just draw very quickly a couple of conclusions from this. Um, firstly, the Russian system is able to op operate very effectively in places such as Guatemala. It's perceived by some political forces as that there as being a first world country that is anti-American and therefore an attractive partner. It knows how to apply pressure. It hired the top two law firms in Guatemala. Um, at least one of them <clears throat> had done no due diligence, never questioned the, uh, the Russian narrative. Um, under Russian influence, uh, I believe that CSIG, the anti-corruption agency, has been responsible for, for, for gross violation of the Bitkov's human rights. And the interesting point here is that CSIG's Western funders and supporters of the anti-corruption effort have been deaf to calls for investigation of CSIG's role um, in the prosecution of the Bitkov's. To question the agency's integrity is to be seen to uh, ally yourself with corrupt interests in Guatemala. Yet there are very strong indications that 
those two Russian state banks, VTB and Gaz um, Gazprom Bank, both under US and EU sanctions, have collaborated with this agency and benefited from Western involvement in the anti-corruption effort in Guatemala. Let me stop now. Thanks, Paul. John, thank you very much. And I think what you're highlighting is something that comes out in the report as well, which is that uh, we tend to focus on the, the, the Russian activities in the United States and in Europe, but obviously the reach is, is beyond that. We, um, we have with us now um, Representative Keating, and he's been able to join us, and we're very appreciative of that. And so what we're going to do is turn to his remarks, and then we'll continue the, the panel in a few moments. Um, Mr. Keating, he, rep he uh, has been a representative from Massachusetts since 2011. And he, um, he represents the 9th Congressional District. Um, I'm not sure where that is, but if it's Boston, you know, I'm from New York, so there's a little bit of potential issue there. But he's a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, Representative Keating has had a long career in Massachusetts state government, serving as a representative, a senator, and a district attorney at various points between 1978 and 2011. He holds his JD from Suffolk University and has both a BA and an MBA from Boston College. Mr. Keating, thank you for, for joining us this morning. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if I'm a little tired, it's because we, I'm on the Armed Services Committee and we were working till we finished up at 7 a.m. this morning, uh, working overnight. Uh, I'm, I have represented Boston in another life. However, uh, I have uh, Cape Cod, the South Shore, South Coast of Massachusetts, and Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, and there's nothing but New York license plates. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to escape New York and come to, uh, come to our area. Well, thank you so much. And sorry to interrupt and take you out of turn, uh, taking me out of turn, but I'll be very brief. Uh, just highlighting and thanking you for having this meeting uh, for the foundation. Uh, it's a very important time historically. I think it's not a hyperbole to say that. And we're in very different times. Um, I think with Russia, uh, and I'll always differentiate when I have the opportunity between the Russian people uh, and the Russian leadership. And, uh, you know, it's clear uh, the direction that the Russian leadership, uh, President Putin, will continue to go. I think myself that uh, a few years back, uh, he was unnerved with uh, facing some kind of uh, uh, domestic uh, protests and uh, dissatisfaction uh, in his area, and I think that uh, that solidified his his way of uh, his formulating a plan uh, where he put his own uh, re-election, if you will, if you want to call it an election, uh, first, uh, and where uh, he had his vision. Uh, to try and move towards the former uh, Soviet Union. And, and you see in Georgia and you see in Ukraine and other areas that become quite evident. Uh, but what can we do? Where's our place in this? And I think that uh, one of the things that I've concentrated, I'm the chairman of the uh, subcommittee on Europe, Eurasia, uh, in the Foreign Affairs Committee. And uh, I really am putting an emphasis on that committee on uh, creating bonds with our European allies at a time that things are becoming fragmented between us and where uh, among uh, the European Union countries there's a, uh, uh, a feeling, at least a significant minority uh, of Eurosceptics and uh, separatists that want to pull things apart. Uh, I think that there's one thing uh, that we face together uh, our European allies in the United States, and that's a threat from China, which I think is first and foremost, and Russia secondarily. But we have one thing that uh, Russia and China do not have. We have an historic coalition, and that's our strength. They don't have that. Uh, we have the ability to, uh, you know, band together uh, in very close uh, shared values that we have. And where I think we can make the most impact uh, is extending uh, the type of relationship we do in terms of security and military uh, cooperation that we might have in NATO, but extend that to the economic side and, uh, as well. Uh, and, you know, I'm very disappointed with President Trump's uh, move to use his emergency uh, security powers, something that was given to the President 
uh, its office in right after 9-11 uh, and use that uh, where it's clearly not a case of security and actually use it uh, as a, uh, a hammer uh, over our closest allies. I think that's cr created a great deal of uh, division, and disappointment uh, among our European friends. And indeed, I think that we should be uh, moving in the other direction uh, t towards free trade agreements, uh, strengthening our economic uh, bonds together. And that uh, will put us in a place where we'll have more influence uh, in a way that's not viewed uh, through the prism of military uh, influence. I don't think we can shut the door on Russia. We certainly have, uh, will have things in common. Trying to uh, have the continuation of the START agreement is important. But I do feel that uh, we have to do it from a position of strength. And that doesn't mean how many missiles you have. Uh, it means uh, sharing values of uh, human rights, freedoms, uh, the freedom of the press, freedom of religion, uh, the freedom uh, to speak out uh, with a free press and not risk uh, being jailed uh, or uh, worse. So I think that uh, this is an important time. But we should look at it as a time where we do have possibilities going forward uh, and we can deal uh, from strength. So your, your foundation is uh, here at a very important time. I appreciate you know, keeping these discussions at the forefront because uh, around here, if you follow some of the news, uh, they'll, they'll look at it through a very narrow window. Uh, and that's really not everything that's going on here. Uh, I know I've been just since January uh, to Europe, uh, traveling among many of the countries. Uh, twice already. The Speaker of the House has been there three times since January, uh, and we're going to try and keep a congressional presence there uh, as well. So uh, I hope that uh, your day is successful here. I hope that we can learn from this, uh, share some of those views, uh, not only uh, in the U.S., uh, but among our allies, and to the extent that we can, share that with the people uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, Balkans, share it with, uh, to the extent we can, the Russian people themselves. So thank you very much for being here. I appreciate that. And I uh, hope you have a great conference. So thank you, Congressman. Um, so we'll return to our panel focus now. Ed, we'll turn to you now for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much to the organizers for, for putting on this very important event today. Um, Nikita Kulachenkov uh, is an investigative accountant who was working for um, the Moscow-based anti-corruption foundation that was headed, is headed by opposition act activist Alexei Navalny. In 2013, he pulled down a, uh, an, a, a poster um, in the city of Vladimir. Um, the poster was valued by its creator, it was a piece of street art, at $2. Um, Quickly, the uh, investigative committee, which is one of the main sort of tools of repression in Putin's Russia, opened a, a criminal case against Kulachenkov. Um, before that process could move forward, Kulachenkov fled the country, moved to Lithuania, and was granted uh, refugee status. Um, two years later, upon arriving in Nicosia, uh, the capital of Cyprus, um, he was detained based on an arrest uh, request transmitted through Interpol. Um, after three weeks in jail, he's eventually uh, released um, after an intervention from the Cypriot Minister of Justice. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today a little bit is about how Russia uh, is abusing uh, Interpol um, and Russian use of Interpol to target opponents living abroad, journalists, opposition activists, um, human rights, uh, human rights uh, defenders and, and, and activists, um, has resulted in dozens of arrests uh, across Europe um, and has extended into the United States itself. Even though the Department of Justice um, has, has uh, sort of issued um, a statement or a policy that it does not take red notices alone, the, the requests issued through Interpol, as a sufficient basis for arrest under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, unfortunately, the Department of Homeland Security hasn't issued similar guidance. And it's because the Department of Homeland Security is responsible for refugee and asylum cases in this country um, there have been at least three cases that I'm aware of where individuals who have had arrest requests issued through Interpol, um, those uh, arrest requests have been used 
um, as a reason to deny them asylum, as a reason to deny them uh, bail during whilst they're uh, awaiting trial. So certainly uh, an, another example of the way in which uh, Russian interference through international institutions is undermining the rule of law. And this is part of a much broader process. Um, and as I argue in a recent uh, journal article in the latest issue of the Journal of Democracy, powerful authoritarian states have sought to dilute the democratic dimensions of various international organizations and implant rule by law into these bodies. Interpol is one example of this, and Russia is certainly not the only actor uh, that is involved with this. I do a lot of work on Tajikistan, a very small state, um, and that even, even a small state like Tajikistan has been using Interpol very actively to pursue opponents who fled um, the post-Soviet space. So founded in 1923, currently with 194 member countries, Interpol is obviously the main organization responsible for law enforcement coordination around the world. Uh, according to its own constitution, um, two articles in its constitution it's strictly forbidden from engaging in any intervention or activities of a political, military, religious, or racial character. According to another article in its constitution, it's supposed to work within the spirit of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whatever, whatever uh, that's supposed to mean, as I'll mention in a moment. So unlike Hollywood movies, um, Interpol doesn't have agents itself. Um, instead, it's obviously, it forms a sort of basis of communication and information sharing amongst law enforcement bodies around the world. Um, in terms of abuse to Interpol, sort of um, uh, to, to uh, sort of systems within Interpol have been particularly manipulated by Russia. The first is red notices that are a more formal uh, arrest request that has to contain um, a certain information about the charges against the individual, biographical information. Um, and is issued through Interpol's <coughs> general secretariat and has to go undergo a degree of, of, of oversight. Um, and then the second system is diffusions, and these are the ones that are really being used much more frequently by actors like Russia. And that's as though if you imagine that you have the email address of every law enforcement um, body in the world and you just click send all. So it's an instantaneous transmission of information about an individual. It's, an, it's a request to arrest them. Initially, it's supposed to be intended to help you know, uh, arrest fugitives who are fleeing across a border, um, but is being increasingly used to bypass oversight from Interpol itself and target uh, individuals uh, uh, despite who, who, against whose charges are sort of political. So it's really been diffusions that have surged in recent years. Um, 50,000 uh, diffusions were issued in 2017 alone. There are now over 100,000 of these diffusions in circulation. Red notices have also increased from 1,277 in 2002 to 13,000 uh, by 2017. So we've seen a mass proliferation of this, and this is partly due to uh, the abuse of Interpol by states like, uh, like Russia. Unfortunately, Interpol doesn't publish any data on states that are the most abusive, and that speaks to a broader problem with Interpol as a lack of transparency. Um, but we certainly know that Russia, Turkey, uh, probably the two states that are abusing this system uh, intended to help law enforcement address petty uh, sort of a common law crime. Um, we can certainly imagine that, that, that Russia and Turkey are two of the, two of the biggest defenders here. Um, whereas because of the non-refoulement principle, the idea that you can't return uh, individuals to countries where torture is, is practiced, um, because of that system, there have been very few cases of individuals being successfully extradited um, from Western democracies back to Russia. But as the sort of Kulachenkov case points to, a number of other cases points to, having a red notice issued against you can lead to prolonged detention, um, can lead to problems, obviously leads to problems of mobility, being able to travel to certain parts of the world where, um, where they're more likely to uh, act on a red notice issued by Russia. Uh, parts of the Middle East, for example, or Africa, um, can create problems finding jobs, applying for credit cards, a whole host of issues that, that really disrupt the, the sort of everyday life um, and uh, sort of ability to, to, to live, live a normal life for these individuals who fled uh, persecution uh, in Russia. As I said, Interpol has a culture which lacks transparency, and many individuals, um, I guess, such as Kulichenkov, aren't even aware that they're on one of these wanted lists until they're detained at an airport or a, or a, or a sort of a, a border transit point. Um, unfortunately, the information in the red notices themselves, and these aren't all published online, are the property of the, um, property of the issuing party. So uh, in this case, the Russian Federation. 
And so there is a process by which you can gain information about what you're charged with, but it ultimately needs to be granted by uh, the, the issuing party. And in some cases, there is a mechanism by which Interpol can, can, can release that information, but it's a very lengthy process. So theoretically, there's supposed to be a sort of right to access of information about the charges against you, but in reality, it's actually quite limited. So what can be done? Uh, asked to give um, some policy recommendations. I think one, and I have a number of them that, that perhaps um, would be relevant. I think with regards to Interpol's penetration into the United States itself, I think the Department of Homeland Security needs to issue similar guidelines to the Department of Justice to uh, indicate that red notices themselves are not reason enough to deny someone asylum in the, in the United States. Um, and that obviously we can't uh, operate on the principle that charges by, made by the Russian Federation, um, the government of the Russian Federation, um, are of equal value to charges made in, in, in more democratic states. So I think that's what the Department of Homeland Security can do. Um, the US government, obviously the, um, the, the, the US presence within Interpol, I think as Ted Broman from the Heritage Foundation has suggested, could create a caucus within the General Assembly with um, other democratic states um, to push for certain reforms. And this includes defining what they mean by the spirit of the UN Declaration of Rights, what they mean by political, so they can create clear guidelines and measures by which you can um, well, by which individuals can dispute the red notices that have been issued against them. They need to create mechanisms to make it much more easy for uh, individuals who've had red notices issued against them uh, to gain access to that information. They've made certain steps in that direction, but still more needs to be done. And they think they need to change the diffusion system and make it much more, give some sort of oversight to the Interpol's uh, secretariat based in Lyon um, to give some sort of oversight before that, those uh, diffusions are issued to uh, different parties. And I think most importantly, and this is something that um, hasn't been done yet, but there is a, there, within the rules of processing data, uh, one of the sort of documents, guidelines for the operation of Interpol, there is an article that allows for the suspension of abusing states. No one's invoked that article yet. Um, it would require, I think, a vote at the executive committee, 13-person executive committee of Interpol. But there is a mechanism by which um, Theoretically, you could suspend uh, a member state um, that is seen to be routinely abusing uh, the system. And so I think, I think there's certainly plenty of more things that Interpol can do, plenty of things that the United States can do um, and, and its allies can do to prevent countries like Russia uh, abusing this uh, international institution that's supposed to be about the rule of law. And thank you very much. And, and I also want to uh, express appreciation for highlighting the challenges with Interpol. It's, it's a tremendously valuable entity organization concept and it, taking steps to make sure it is not uh, become you know abused and therefore not an effective tool is something that's very important that we all remain focused and active on um, Neil you're gonna you're gonna provide us uh, the, the last set of remarks and then we'll have a few minutes for questions and Neil your background as a journalist I think is gonna really help add additional insight so thank you thank you um, and, and thank you again to Natalia and Michael and Michael Weiss and uh, all the organizers of this uh, excellent paper and, and event. Um, before I go on to the, the subject of, of my contribution, um, I just wanted to make a couple of um, more general points uh, in response to things that were said earlier. The first is um, to uh, echo what Ilya said. Uh, it's important, I think, that we're not complacent uh, about, about Russia and the things that Russia does. The um, gentleman who spoke earlier said Russia is, uh, is not really a competitor of the United States. Um, it has a, an economy that's narrowly um, powered by natural resources. Uh, it's declining. It lacks um, cultural gravity and so on. And, and all of those things are true. But in a sense, they don't really matter. In the long-term competitor of the United States and its Western allies, I think it's clear, is China. But Russia poses a threat which is different from being a competitor, in that Russia is an authoritarian state which has made, frankly, <laughs> screwing the West its national strategic priority. The resources that are poured into this effort to damage and destroy and undermine the West are, are simply vast. 
They draw on huge pools of dark money, um, mostly in private hands and outside of Russia. They draw on a lot of very impressive human capital. And as Russia is an authoritarian state, that um, objective, that effort, which is counterproductive and takes resources away from things like uh, healthcare and education, um, is able to maintain itself as a, na as a national priority. Um, and so that wrecking mission uh, and the will behind it is not to be underestimated. Uh, and I think that dismissals of Russia as upper volta with nukes and so on, which are quite popular in Washington, um, miss the point completely. Uh, the second thing is in, in response to what Daniel Kimmage said, that we ought not to focus too closely uh, or, or exclusively uh, on, on digital matters, on disinformation, on botnets and trolls. Uh, this, this is important. Um, but I think there's a little too much focus on it. Um, as I see it, the Russian um, active measures weapon that is pointed at us at the moment rests on a tripod. One leg of that tripod is digital, what I've just described. The other two legs are financial, essentially money laundering into front organizations, people who've been co-opted, uh, and so on. Uh, and the third leg um, relates to more traditional uh, espionage and influence operations. Those three legs operate together to support the weapon. If we only look at the one leg, which is digital, we miss the point. And I think the great <coughs> thing about this report is that it addresses those other two legs, particularly the third, which is to do with more traditional influence and espionage operations intended to undermine our, our institutions and government. Um, now, to turn to what I've written about in this paper, uh, the subject essentially is uh, populist leaders in Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe um, taking control of interior ministries, which then gives them control of security services. This is naturally a quite difficult subject to write about for the obvious reason that um, state security organizations uh, operate in secret. Um, what they do is, is seldom seen, and therefore there's a danger that when you, when you write about them, uh, you're your writing can be dismissed as speculative. Uh, and for that reason, I've stuck quite closely in this paper to publicly available open source information, um, which, which I believe to be correct. Um, the three states uh, focused on here, they're, they're not the only cases, but I think they're the most interesting and probably the most, the most egregious. Um, each, each state is, is fundamentally different. Um, Hungary uh, is the most interesting case, I think, in the sense that Viktor Orban and Fidesz have been in power since 2010. It's a majority government, there's no coalition, and so they control Interior and all of the other ministries. And in those nine years, um, the point that I've made in this paper is that Hungary, while remaining a member of NATO, has become, in security terms, an ally of Russia and an adversary of NATO. Now, the way that this would be batted away by the Hungarians is to say, look, we might grumble a bit about sanctions on Russia, but in the end, we don't veto them. We contribute to NATO missions. We are not off the reservation. But when you start to examine specific actions taken by the Hungarians in the security sphere, it's quite clear that Hungary, while being a member of NATO, has become an adversary of NATO. Uh, and the proof of that is that uh, NATO allies uh, have stopped sharing uh, most information with the Hungarians. They don't do this at the public level, um, and I'll come to the reason for that in a moment. The second case is Austria. Um, the Freedom Party of Austria, um, in fact, the whole government has collapsed. And so uh, there are going to be elections, and we'll see what happens. Um, but in the uh, year and a half when the Freedom Party has 
has had control of the Interior Ministry, uh, it's managed to wreak a huge amount of damage. Now, of course, Austria is different from Hungary in the sense that it's a neutral state and it's not a member of NATO. But it has had um, a tradition of uh, loose security cooperation with Western states uh, under the, uh, the Club of Bern format. Uh, that all came to uh, an end, hopefully not permanently, last year when um, the Freedom Party Interior Minister Kickel ordered um, a street crime unit of the Vienna police to raid the BVT, the security uh, service, uh, and to seize their hard drives. Um, now, those hard drives uh, were in the possession of uh, the commander of that unit for 30 minutes unsupervised when he was driving them to a court. And it's this specific fact that caused the Germans and subsequently other um, members of the Club of Bern to suspend um, all meaningful interaction with the Austrian service. Uh, the third case is, is the Liga Nord uh, in Italy. Um, Matteo Salvini, uh, as well as being Deputy Prime Minister, uh, is Interior Minister. Um, but so far, uh, I think, has not made uh, much progress in um, changing the leadership or orientation of the Italian security services. And one reason for that is Italy has quite strong constitutional breaks uh, on, on messing around with these institutions. Um, but it's early days, and all the signs that come out of the Liga Nord and out of the mouth of Salvini would suggest that this is one of his, um, one of his ambitions. And, and none of this really is new. Um, in the 1940s, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, when there were popular front governments, which included communists, uh, those communist uh, participants in popular front governments would always go for the interior ministry uh, as the portfolio of choice because uh, in Soviet doctrine, power grows out of the interior ministry, like it grows out of the barrel of a gun for Mao. Uh, and it's very striking that both in Austria and Italy, the populists getting into power um, both made a beeline for the interior ministry. Um, of course, the Freedom Party of Austria and the Liga Nord are both formerly partner parties of United Russia. Um, and so the link there is, is uh, hardly speculative. What can we do about this? Um, just to wrap up with a conclusion um, and a, a recommendation. Hungary in particular puts allies into a bind. Um, if suspension of uh, cooperation um, becomes formal and is... Uh, is, uh, is made public. The danger is that, that Russia's objectives are served anyway because it's, uh, it's dividing an alliance. But if no action is taken, then there's no deterrent and there's no price paid. So the policy recommendation I would make is that in the case of NATO, which of course doesn't apply to Austria, uh, there should be a, a formal um, charter for NATO intelligence agencies, which, for example, formally excludes um, the signing of bilateral information sharing with the Russian Interior Ministry, which the Hungarians have done, supposedly for terrorism and organized crime, but that can become a framework for uh, a creeping um, further cooperation. And that if this charter is violated, that there can be um, a public statement by NATO, a, a vote and a public statement whereby there would be, for example, a six-month suspension of security collaboration, which would then be reviewed to see if the situation's improved. Um, thank you. Neil, thank you. Uh, we, we have 10 minutes for questions. What I propose is we take about four questions um, and then open it to the panel for brief responses. Uh, if you, um, I would ask if you quickly introduce yourself, um, make it a question, not a speech, and also recall that our panelists here have um, spoken of case studies and focused on, on legal 
um, the gaps in both legal and, and, and sort of policy measures, and we'll be dealing with other topics later. So do we have any comments or questions? Perhaps if you just don't mind speaking loudly for uh, for right now. Thank you. My name is Diamond Liu. I'm a independent activist. Uh, Hong Kong is under massive attack on the rule of law, and the Hong Kong and the Hong Kong people are resisting massively. I know something. How um, China cooperated with Russia on the assault of many uh, democratic values. I'd like to hear from the specialists on Russia on how Russia is cooperating with China on the attack of uh, democratic values. Thank you. Other questions or one in the back? Um, any any other questions? Okay, so uh, we have one question here in the front. Um, hi, my name is Ellen Moore. I'd like to ask, um, what's the point of Interpol at this point? Uh, what would we lose if it was expanded? Um, okay, so we have five minutes. Thank you. We have three questions. Um, I open it to whomever would like to respond. Yeah, J Jacob, thank you for that. Um, I completely agree. And in my paper, uh, particularly regarding Orban, I spoke about the, um, or wrote about the, the interaction between this emerging kleptocracy uh, in Hungary, which is family based. I'd say that Orban has moved from a central European model of kleptocracy, where some standards of good taste and moderation still prevail, to a central Asian um, model of very open family kleptocracy on a huge scale in which Russia, as a provider of the goodies, um, plays a central role. That, I believe, locks Orban into a relationship with Russia which is extremely toxic for Hungary and its allies. And so it's very important, I think, that the Czech Republic um, doesn't succumb to this uh, this Rossatom deal as well, which I, I understand is is not uh, is not making as much um, progress as it was, and that uh, it, may, it may not go ahead. But um, I, I completely agree with with what you say. Any response to the question of um, potential Russian collaboration with China on the suppression? Um, obviously, there is, there has been great cooperation between Eurasian kleptocracies, learning from each other, and. Free Russia Foundation has written uh, in partnership uh, actually with Human Rights First on uh, how authoritarian states learn from each other, for example, in um, uh, passing through uh, anti-LGBT uh, um, legislation around the world. Uh, but uh, we know that Russia and China are cooperating on suppressing in independent internet, um, abusing um, uh, uh, the theme of uh, fighting is, uh, Islamic terrorists. We know, we, we all know about um, concentration camps in Uyghur region, for example, 
uh, and the West is only waking up to this problem. Um, Russia previously has been doing the same thing with uh, the, the exploiting in similar ways uh, su suppression of uh, Chechnya and, and, and so forth. Um, I would say that uh, on, on the question of Interpol, also, if I may, um, uh, we, we have to have uh, international mechanisms uh, for cooperation, but we just need to create safeguards uh, to um, to protect them. And uh, I, I completely agree with um, Ad uh, and, and Neil that we just uh, we have to have some filters and containment. Uh, of messages and, and uh, information coming from uh, kleptocracies like, Ru like Russia and not take them at face value. So in a way, we have to create our own due diligence and, and uh, not take cooperation with ministries of justice of Russia um, on, on an equal basis. Um, um, so um, that's one of the way forward. Sure. Please. Just a, a brief response to, to Jakob's uh, question. It seems, it seems to me that uh, in the Czech Republic, if you can maintain a level of transparency um, around any negotiation that takes place with uh, Rosatom, then it will make a big difference. Um, in Hungary, as, as far as I'm aware, the details of that um, Rosatom deal over Pox have been classified for 30 years, something like that, um, which is absolutely extraordinary. And I don't believe that is going to happen um, in the Czech Republic. So if you can keep shining the bright lights, it's going to make a big difference. Yeah, if I may, on, on, on Interpol. No, I think there is still a place for Interpol, and I think you know it's very difficult to know precisely how many of these red notices and diffusions are genuinely abusive. Um, I think you know Interpol still has a role in breaking up trafficking, human trafficking gangs, paedophilia rings, all, all sorts of uh, all sorts of crimes you know that are transnational in nature. And so I think you know in an increasingly sort of globalized world, obviously there there is still a role for Interpol. And I think Interpol has, as I said, within many of its, its procedures and documents, you know mechanisms to protect itself against abuse. I think it needs to clarify some of those and create actual active policies, as I said, to define and, and to, to strengthen the organization against abuse. But I, I think, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think, I, think I think there's certainly still a role for Interpol. Uh, Melissa, did you want to jump in at all? We, no, okay. that's good. I wanted to also to make one very quick announcement that uh, we have uh, about uh, 15 cases here, but we couldn't put everything uh, in, in this one uh, volume. And uh, on the website of Free Russia Foundation, we have a number of cases on Russian oligarchs uh, written with our partners uh, or by ourselves on Dmitry Rabalovlev, on Suleiman Kirimov, and how they interact with uh, Western legal systems. Uh, we have a case on uh, uh, poisoning of uh, BP's CEO um, and Oxford's due diligence on the site underminers.info. Uh, we will uh, talk about this uh, uh, in our further presentations, uh, maybe during Q&As, and we plan to maybe uh, uh, expand this volume later in the fall and add more cases. The thing is, uh, these things are happening so quickly every day, the volume of information on Russian interference in judicial processes is just overwhelming. Every week uh, we can basically publish a volume like this. So uh, we're just uh, picking and choosing uh, th one of the biggest problems is actually to just to convey this in simple terms to the Western audiences. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute coffee break. There are restrooms around the side. And um, before we break, if we could um, uh, offer our appreciation to our panelists. And thank you for joining us. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm very glad you're speaking together with Jacob. Uh, have you met him? Yes, we actually put together on several things. Before the Yes, yes, I hope to make it. I don't know. Check, check. No, it's working a little. Check, 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 check. Yeah, they're cute. And now they're cute. cute. Mm -hmm. Mic check, one, two, mic check. Check one two. Oh. You gotta speak loud into them. You gotta talk. You can't. You can't hold it out here. You gotta. You gotta get up on it. Well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. 
TV upstairs. If I put okay. it up anymore, I'm afraid it'll go. There. No, the last one I really didn't work. First story. Like people were holding. Um, try that one. No. Talk into the mic. Not into the side of the mic. Into the mic. So this actually, this story was all yes. hooked. Okay. okay. Into the mic. Yeah. Not to the side. Into the no, mic. Not, neither into the mic or outside. But thank you very much. These are 12 years old, but they still okay. work. <laughs> thank you so much for coming down. Though. You can no turn it off where you're not used to it. Okay. And I can turn up a little more gain upstairs. Oh, I'll monitor. Good. Yeah, our, 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 our computers are all upstairs. Thank you so much for coming down. I could be And I let them go and let the people know. Just <laughs> thank you. Taking their seats. Oh, there you are. Yeah, you're. Yeah, yeah, you're there. If people wouldn't mind taking their seats, we're going to get started.
Yeah. So our second panel is going to begin now. If our other panelists could join us up front. Wonderful, thank you, and thank you for keeping to the, the minimal time we gave you all for a coffee and a chat break. We apologize, but we're just, there's a lot of information we're trying to convey, and so we're, 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 we're condensed on schedule. So I, I really appreciate your coming back in so quickly. So our first panel, is, as you saw, we, we discussed, our panelists spoke to both the case studies and the challenges facing legal institutions and activities that I would sort of call above the line. Now we're getting into an area that, um, that, that a little bit more of the world I used to live in, things that are going to happen, happening below the line, both in terms of the active measures um, and the manipulation of, of institutions um, by uh, you know, non-legal non means, not, not trying to work through the rules as they exist. Um, I will say I just returned. I was in Georgia last week, and there's certainly um, fascinating perspective there in terms of both the the occupation and then the active measures and the uh, campaign that's going on there. It, it's alive uh, in many, many places. Uh, as I said, in Georgia, it's quite acute right now, and it is elsewhere as well. So this panel, this is what we're going to focus in on. We have a distinguished group. Now, I will apologize to the panelists because of our time crunch. I went into detail on everyone's really impressive backgrounds. But I think what I'd rather do is focus on the, um, your time to deliver the substance of your presentations. And so I will just very quickly um, turn to the speakers. And um, I'll mention first Anna, Anna Borshevskaya, sorry about that. She's at the Washington Institute, and she focuses on Russia's policy toward the Middle East. Um, Jacob Yanda, who asked a question in the back, he is the director of European Values Think Tank and head of Kremlin Watch in Prague. Uh, Mr. Jeremy Lamoureux, he is an associate professor of international studies and political science at BYU, um, Idaho, and his research focuses on relations between the West and Russia. And Mr. Martin Vladimirov, um, who is um, an economic analyst at the Center of the Study of Democracy, which is a European public policy institute dedicated to the values of democracy and market economies. So again, I apologize for not going into the detail of everyone's very impressive backgrounds, but I think it is most important. Oh, did I mention Dr. Fuller? Sorry. Um, <laughs> he is the Gene Kirkpatrick <laughs> Fellow at AEI. Um, now I'm going to spend a little more time on you, Clay, since I, I forgot to before. Um, so he focuses in on authoritarian survival, corruption, and the means through which dictators, terrorists, and criminals use free markets to restrict freedom, sow discord, and legitimize their actions. Um, so I apologize for, for missing any introductions. Um, unless you have an order that you have predetermined, I think we'll continue, and I'll ask Jeremy you to speak first. Again, we're shooting for seven minutes each on presentations and then have time for Q&A. So thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. I, uh, this is kind of, I'm a teacher, so most of the time, which is the classroom, right? I don't have a lot of influence on policy making, so this is kind of a thrill, you know? Um, also, I just, uh, just wanted to, uh, a little disclaimer that my views have nothing to do with my university uh, or its sponsoring institution, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So these are my views. Um, my focus, my research focuses a lot on I focus on security between Russia and the West. Geographically, I focus on the Baltic states, and uh, as far as uh, discipline goes, I focus on all areas of security, but more recently, my emphasis has been on um, minority rights, and, and, uh, and that's what brings me into this. So, one of the areas of conflict between uh, Russia and the West, uh, in the Baltic space, in the Baltic states specifically, uh, focuses on uh, the Russian-speaking minority in the Baltic states because there's rather a significant Rus Russian-speaking 
and uh, ethnically Russian mi minority in Latvia and uh, Estonia specifically. The same sort of problem exists in Ukraine as, as well. There are ethnic and linguistic challenges there, uh, and so they, they share some common challenges. Um, specifically, uh, I I've, have, have recently been focusing on uh, Russia's weaponization of the ethno-linguistic Russian minority and the potential to use them almost as a fifth column. Uh, and I'm not claiming that they do, uh, but there's a potential that they could. We know for sure that they, they have a lot of influence on the Russian-speaking minority uh, through media uh, because in, in many of the cases, in the Baltic states especially, uh, there's the only Russian-speaking media they have access to is stuff that is, is Kremlin-sponsored or Kremlin-influenced. And so that's the influence, that, that's, the, that's the media that they get. And that's not even to mention the, the social media, uh, the influence that Russia has through social media. Um, the challenge in Latvia and, Lithuania, or Latvia and Estonia specifically, though, is that the governments of Latvia and Estonia have taken steps to, to marginalize Russian speakers and marginal, marginalized ethnic Russians in general. So they have uh, language policies in place that that uh, that prevent the use or very or or limit the use of Russian. They have citizenship citizenship laws in place that that uh, that they don't let Russians, again ethnic Russians or linguistic Russians, get citizenship, which is really a challenge because in so many of their cases, they were born and raised in the Baltic states uh, during the Soviet era, and regardless of that, they weren't able to get citizenship. And so there are a lot of them who have been marginalized. Um, so as far as what this looks like going forward, um, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe the US and Europe, uh, not maybe, the US and Europe can do more to encourage the Baltic states uh, and Ukraine to, to take steps to essentially stop marginalizing the Russian minority. Uh, the reason this is useful is, is if they can do that, if they can integrate the Russian minority, uh, include them as part of society, uh, it undermines uh, the Kremlin's attempts to weaponize uh, the Russian minority, in these cases at least. Um, obviously there are sorts of challenges to this because, uh, because they're perceived as, as tools of the Kremlin, and in some cases they, they may be tools of the Kremlin, but in the process of trying to integrate them more and encourage them more to become part of society, that could limit the Kremlin's influence, uh, that could uh, limit the tensions that exist in society, and uh, in general just help the Baltic states, as, as sort of the frontier between Russia and the West, help the Baltic states to become uh, more integrated with the West, and and uh, become much, much less of a cause of tension between Russia and the West. Jeremy, thank you. And I think that's a really interesting point. Um, my son was in Estonia a couple of years back working on, on languages, Russian language skills, and he was living with a Russian language speaking family, and he asked them, where are they from, the parents? And they did not say they were Estonian, they did not say they were Russian, they said they were from the Soviet Union. Mm. So I thought it was kind of an interesting vignette in terms of the real, the real tension that exists within people um, during this period. So yeah, thank you for raising absolutely. that as an issue. Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, I also uh, would like to thank Natalia and Ile for inviting me to collaborate um, for this very exciting project. And, uh, and as the speaker said earlier this morning, it's crucial to not just focus on media propaganda and disinformation but really try to go in depth into what are some of the institutional deficits that Russia takes advantage of in the West in order to expand its influence. Um, uh, we have been, at CSD, Center for Study of Democracy, we have been working on the Russian influence for the last five, six years, uh, in measuring, trying to understand what is the Russian economic footprint, so what, what share of the economy Russia controls. And our contribution for, for, for the Free uh, Russia Foundation report uh, is just a sketch of the situation uh, in Bulgaria. Um, Bulgaria, um, the country where I come from, uh, is probably the weakest link in Europe. Um, in terms of economy, it's the most vulnerable to Russian economic influence. Uh, we estimate that around the 
um, fifth of the economy is directly or indirectly controlled by Russian companies. Um, not only the energy sector, which is probably the most visible, but in a number of other strategic areas, including telecommunications, the tobacco industry, um, advertising, uh, and a number of other uh, media outlets related to these advertising revenues. Um, in our sketch of the Bulgarian situation, we focused on, on three major cases of how Russia translates this economic footprint uh, into uh, something that we call state capture. Uh, state capture of institutions key for, uh, uh, for businesses and business sectors that are vital for the general being, well-being of the economy, including energy, uh, natural gas, um, meaning fuels distribution, um, uh, telecommunication, etc. Um, so th this has been, state capture has been the mechanism of actually achieving political influence over some dependence uh, in, in strategic sectors. Um, the most famous case uh, in this area, I think, has been the South Stream gas project, a pipeline that, uh, if you remember, died uh, in 2014, but um, uh, was one of the major tools Russia has been using in order to dominate uh, and basically um, solidify its um, dominance of energy markets in Southeast Europe and Central Europe. Um, now there is a re reincarnation of this project called Turkstream, but really it, it was South Stream where you could see this fusion of economic and political interests. Um, and in Bulgaria, um, um, Gazprom was able to directly change the energy law of the country using uh, proxies within the parliament and within state-owned energy companies, within the energy regulator, uh, and in this way undermine not only Bulgarian uh, uh, legislation, energy legislation and competition law, but the whole EU energy law, namely the third energy package that ensures uh, that there is no control of production and transmission of natural gas in Europe. Um, and the, the energy amendment, the energy law amendment passed Parliament uh, after uh, basically uh, 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 Gazprom giving direct amendments in track changes of this energy law. Uh, one of the opposition parties then released uh, uh, basically this document showing the track changes and it was very funny that the, the amendments done into the energy law then <coughs> included the same, this same uh, track changes that Gazprom uh, used in its version of the document. Um, uh, the project was finally stopped late in 2014 after, the, um, um, after an infringement procedure started by the European Commission, but we were that close of actually locking uh, most of southeastern and central Europe into a long-term, quite asymmetrical energy relationship that would have basically uh, uh, ensured Gazprom's dominance of gas markets uh, in this part of the world for the next three, four decades at least. Um, there is now repetition of the same scenario with Turkstream, but this time around there is little attention from the US and the, Europe, and the EU, and this is quite frightening uh, because the same mechanisms, uh, the same attempt to use uh, 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 the control of institutions um, to, to push through the project uh, are used, but no one pays attention. So it's important that this report hopefully will raise attention to also current events. The second issue, and uh, I know that I have overstepped my time probably, no, yeah. um, is the case of Lukoil, um, the, which is the largest company in, in Southeast Europe. Uh, it's also the biggest investor in the region, uh, one of the biggest investors in general in Central Europe, um, it has played an enormous role in also uh, maintaining Russia's energy dominance, but on the oil side. Um, in Bulgaria, it uh, generates around 25% of the budget revenue in the country, indirectly through VAT and excise taxes, um, and controls 65% of the wholesale market and probably around a third of the wholesale market of whole Southeast Europe, wholesale market for fuel distribution. 
And uh, we all know that oil is a uh, is more liquid uh, uh, um, source of energy, which is competitive. Usually, people don't care about um, monopoly prices there because it seems that in a global market you can access oil from everywhere you want. But Luke Oil has again used its quite important influence in key institutions, the antitrust authority, the customs agency of Bulgaria, and also I would say in, in Serbia, Northern Macedonia and Montenegro, uh, in order to prevent competition to take place in this critical market. And since we're talking about economies in Southeast Europe and in Bulgaria in particular, uh, which is quite small and quite dependent on this uh, VAT and excise tax revenue, uh, uh, Lukor has been able to, to uh, uh, use this dependence, uh, financial dependence, uh, to basically overcharge customers, we estimate uh, by around 15 to 16 percent in certain periods of time, uh, which has been uh, quite an important burden on businesses. At the same time, uh, uh, institutions that are responsible to basically regulate the business, the fuel distribution business, have been unable to stop malpractices, including tax evasion or at least avoidance, um, in the amounts of around 10 billion level, which is around 5 billion euros. Uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these revenues would have been critical to finance a number of uh, uh, much more important projects than South Stream, for example, including healthcare reform, education system, etc. But instead were wasted through uh, siphoning off of these profits to offshore entities in Switzerland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, etc. Um, uh, so, um, because I, I want to raise the attention without going into too much details, the importance is that um, key regulatory institutions are not doing their jobs. Why? Because they're purposefully uh, kept underfinanced um, with very little professional administrative capacity and with enormous political meddling. And that's where Russia is able to be quite, quite influential. Because it controls the indirectly quite, quite a few political parties in the countries, actually out of five parties in parliament right now, four and a half parties are directly or indirectly related to Russia. I would say four and a half parties because it is like a small faction that is independent. Uh, uh, it, is, it is able to use this political influence to then meddle into institutional uh, uh, oversight. Um, so it's about us, and these are my final words. It's not about Russia necessarily or China. If we cure our own governance deficits at home, it will be much more difficult for any authoritarian state to penetrate and expand its control over strategic sectors. Thank you. Martin, thank you. And I, I could not emphasize enough your, your final point about the, the existing cleavages in all of our societies. Um, that are being exploited. They're not being um, built out of whole cloth. Uh, Jakub Yanda is going to speak next. One thing I should mention is, is he was involved in a study in the Czech Republic in 2016, um, which was on the influence of foreign powers audit um, of the national security conduct of the Czech, Czech government. So yep. um, if you please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you, Natalia and Ilya, for put, and others for putting this together. Uh, so uh, what I will do is that I'll try to use my seven minutes uh, for two things. One, I would give you a story of uh, one politician and basically of 20 years of development of uh, elite capture and how it went in our case, for example, on one particular example. And then I'll try to come up with two specific things which I believe are not really being done enough, in Europe at least. So uh, without using names to confuse you at first, but all, all what I'm saying is, uh, is first true and second you, uh, or verifiable publicly. So all of that is public information and it must, much of it is in the report which has been just released. So imagine a country of 10 million in Central Europe in, uh, let's say, or previously Czechoslovakia, let's say, so 15, approximately 15 million. In late 80s, what happened was that uh, there, were, there were things called Andropov Institutes. So basically, the thing which the KGB believed could, they could more or less train and cultivate the next generation of political and economic leaders for the region, and we'll see what happens. So this guy was actually selected to be there as uh, lead, one of the leading economists during that time. In the late 80s, he was there as an economist under the very close surveillance of the KGB and the KGB proxy, which was the local intelligence agency called STB. 
Uh, what happened in the 90s is that he has put himself in charge of the Social Democratic Party, which was very uh, center-left political party, which was uh, very weak, only about 5% at the beginning, but he made it a major political force. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1998, he became the prime minister of that 10 million country, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, he was a prime minister for four years. Uh, after basically having to leave uh, after his mandate because of many domestic corruption scandals, he retired from politics in 2002. Uh, he lost the presidential race in 2003, and he said, "I'm done with politics. I'm leaving. Uh, I'm leaving the capital. I'm going uh, basically to a small village. Going just going to do nothing uh, about politics." Well, one of the first visits he got was from a guy who was very, basically nobody knew him in Central Europe, outside of our intelligence community. His name was, and still is, uh, Vladimir Yakunin. Uh, former head of Russian Railways, former uh, Putin's, uh, Putin's close circle insider, and at this moment, in 2019, he's one of the key proxies of Russian intelligence in Europe. Uh, he runs quite a lot of cultivation networks of German and French politicians in Berlin or in Paris, but also in other places. And he's, by the way, he's on the American sanction list. He's not on the European sanction list because the German and French government don't want to put him on that list for various reasons. Uh, so what this guy did is that he came um, as a visitor to meet the, the key leader I'm speaking about, former prime minister of the Czech Republic during that time, and they started to have a nice relationship. Basically, the guy who put them in charge, who put them together, uh, who introduced them, uh, was a very well-known KGB asset in the in the 80s. So basically, close friends coming back together, let's say, because as you know, Mr. Yakunin was a very known senior uh, KGB official in the 80s. That's all again public information. So what happened? 2003, they got together, start getting getting closer. Uh, later on, uh, Mr. Yakunin invites this guy, former Prime Minister of the Czech Republic. Well, you know what? Let's go to let's let's come to our conferences. We have a no lovely place in Rhodos, in a Greek island. Um, every September, uh, every August, September, we have a nice couple of days of conference there. Very former public officials coming over there. Let's discuss what we call the dialogue of civilizations. So very vague topics, basically whatever you want to discuss. So you could com keep coming with us because we are really interested in what you think. You are former prime minister of your country, and nobody cares about you here, but we do. So let's discuss it. Um, so after 2003, uh, this guy, former Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, keeps going there, I think seven, eight times, basically annually he, he goes there. Uh, this Russian proxy basically pays all of, the, um, all of the expenses, not only for him, but members of his family, his advisors, his friends. So it's a cultivation of the relationship in the future. Approximately 2005, 2007, uh, there's another guy who comes to this scene, uh, who later on would become a chief advisor and de facto chief of staff to, um, to the key uh, person of this story. Uh, and this guy, let's say, call him Mr. Advisor, what he did is that he spent approximately 10 years in Moscow working for Lukoil. He still doesn't want to say what he did there, but basically he was working in a very close relationship with the close hierarchy of the oligarchs in Moscow for 10 years. As Czech citizen, but he did this in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, he becomes the advisor to this, to this retired politician. And what he, did, what he does is that he starts a new political party. And he says, well, you know, we, we think you should come back to, the, to our politics. So I'm launching a party which will basically be a platform for you. They run in parliamentary elections, 2012, not successfully, but in 2013 there are, parliament, there are presidential elections. And uh, so he is, um, he is uh, let's say, invited back to, to the political office, and this Mr. Advisor actually manages to put, put, his, put his campaign together with uh, non-transparent financing, with links to Russian proxies. Um, this guy gets elected to chip president, 2013. 2014, Russia invades Ukraine. This guy, uh, currently a president of the Czech Republic, actually starts echoing, starts using Russian disinformation narratives. He's saying there are no Russian soldiers in Ukraine. He is saying we shouldn't be putting sanctions on Russia because of all of this. Later on, what happens? Lukol keeps paying this guy, Mr. Advisor, to the Czech president currently. And uh, in 2012, after sadly, he gets, he gets re-elected uh, with very dubious funding again. Uh, what happens is that um, the president actually starts pushing for a government-to-government -government deal with Rosatom on a nuclear power plant in the Czech Republic. Similar thing which happened with Pax II in Hungary a couple of years ago, approximately since 2015. And uh, this guy, the president of the country, actually starts attacking the intelligence uh, agencies which are actually looking into Russian influence activities, not, so, not surprisingly. 
Um, so now, because there is quite a weak government in Prague, which, which is a minority cabinet supported by a communist party, again a Russian proxy, what happens is that this president actually is putting, uh, is pushing very hard for the Russians to get the strategic deal on a nuclear power plant in the Czech Republic, probably the biggest public uh, acquisition we would do in the last 30 years of the country. So if you go step by step, this is what happened over the last 20 years, and I mean there are dozens of other details, but more or less we have seen a cultivation effort done by Russian proxies, very clearly connected to Russian intelligence, cultivating currently a president of the Czech Republic. He's not in charge of policies, he's not exec head of the executive branch, that's our prime minister, but still you could probably see the level of influence which you could get as Russia in this case. Uh, to finish up, uh, there are two things to do, and uh, I'll ju just use one minute for that. One, uh, there isn't enough of public and shaming, uh, because uh, it's, there's a lot of research into this, but there are not so many organizations across Europe who are actually willing to go out publicly and say this is not good. For, public, for specific individuals if they keep doing this. Uh, the problem there comes that the, the political norms of what is acceptable is actually very, very low. So uh, it's possible to have cases of Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, but there are dozens of smaller cases which are not so visible. There are Austri former Austrian ministers, there are former Czech, Czech ministers of governments working for Russian or Chinese proxies. And almost nobody has a problem with that, and those individuals don't lose political or social credibility that much. So uh, the political cost for them is actually very low. So there, will, there are others thinking about doing it because they don't see that they will lose much. The second thing, and I'm really finishing up, what we don't do much is actually trying to find ways how to sabotage a nexus of Russian and Chinese influence operations in Europe. There is more and more of cooperation or at least synchronization between Russia and China in influencing at least Central Eastern European and Western Balkans countries. Uh, and we don't think enough, even I would say among the experts community, how we could actually make it harder for them to do so, what kind of wedge we could bring. Because those two hostile countries, which actually are doing hostilities against us in this region, they are working more and more in hand in hand. I'm not saying they are going to be great allies forever, but at least in the region I come from, they actually do a lot of things together. And we have to think about how we could make it harder for them, not just be pushing against the Russians. We need to make it harder for both of them. Sorry. Jakob, thank you. And I also very much appreciate your mentioning norms because there's a huge distinction between what is legal and what is right. Yep. And I think um, you know, there, there, it's, it's very difficult for law to always catch up with all what is right. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, Dr. Fuller, he, he, part of his background, I should mention, is um, he focuses on the study of sovereign wealth funds. And for those of you who are not that familiar, what that is is those are basically state-owned investment houses. So instead of um, investment houses focused exclusively on making money, they could also activate, um, <clears throat> they could also focus on, on a political objective as well. So I appreciate your having, having that in your background and look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I don't have much to say about sovereign wealth funds today, but coming soon, uh, we'll say. Um, Jeremy, I appreciated your comments on teaching. I actually see myself as a teacher as well. So I'll start out with uh, explaining that for five years before I came to DC, I was at the University of South Carolina teaching a course on 21st century dictatorships. And what we did was we took the 40 worst ranked countries on the Freedom House score and we surveyed them according to modern theories about how uh, dictatorships survive in the 21st century. And through it with my students, what I would do is I would separate it into levels. So there are people, there's the regime, and then there's the dictator, right? Very different uh, uh, conceptual levels uh, to go at. And we would go through all, there, there, there's several different classes of theories, empirical, formal, uh, uh, case studies uh, to get at this. Uh, but I would go over all of them, uh, explain them how to do that. And the thing that brought me to uh, the whole kleptocracy side of it was one, my research, but first primarily it was over those five years I kept having students after the course, come up to me and say, Dr. Fuller, thank you so much for teaching this course. And I was like, well, great. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. Why are you thanking me for it? Usually I don't get thanked. Usually I get criticized for my grading or something like that, huh. right? Or boring lectures or something. Um, but so I, I was like, why, why are you thanking me? And I said, well, I took this course thinking you were going to tell me about how awesome China is and about how wonderful Dubai is you know, about the development in, in Russia, or the skylines here and there, you know, and, and instead, 
Dr. Fuller, you taught us about genocide and repression and poverty and violence and censorship and all these terrible things that happen in dictatorships all around the world. And I thought this was interesting because I would, you know, I grew up during the Cold War hiding under my desk from air raid silent sirens and stuff. So this was a little bit, a little bit weird for me. Um, so we went around the school and we surveyed people and students. I found the same reaction commonly around it. And I think it's fairly common among younger people uh, in free societies around the world. And I don't blame them for that. That's, you know, something that's there. But I feel it's something that needs to be, to be educated. So getting to this report, which is wonderful, and all the, all the comments up here, I, I could go through and pick through different things that I disagree with or think should, could be done better or in different, in different ways, but that's not what I want to do. Instead, I want to focus on the good that I see in, in all of that, and that's the, the sort of moral courage that it takes to do this kind of work in the, in the anti-kleptocracy world, um, in the fighting for the freedom of people who don't have it, um, for standing up for their rights. So, so you know, courage is, you know, standing up to somebody in the room and telling them how they're, how they're wrong, but moral courage is actually standing up for the people who can't be in the room. And this gets back to the levels that I'm talking about in these regimes. The people in authoritarian regimes cannot be in the room by definition because they are ruled with only implicit consent, right? People in free societies actually give consent to be ruled by their governments freely through their elections, through their free press, through their different, different rights. Um, so, so I want to applaud the moral courage of standing up for the people of Russia, for the people of China, for the people of the different authoritarian regimes uh, around the world and trying to get at this. So briefly getting into my research on this and how I, how I come to approach the, the project, um, what I've found in my research is that the best predictor of how long a modern dictator will survive in office is how much money he embezzles while there. Right? This, is the, this is the leader. You can find this uh, according to many different types of data sets using survival analysis and duration models. Um, but then for an authoritarian regime, the best predictor of how long it will survive is the extent to which it incorporates economic liberalization policies that connect to the rest of the world. Right? So this is an interesting sort of finding that has a whole bunch of different implications. And so what I found with it is to sort of come to the conclusion that this whole strongman kleptocracy, dictator thing, uh, 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 great power conflict, or whatever, whatever the term is that, that we're using for it uh, in the post-Cold War era, right? It relates to this idea that modern dictators typically tend to wear a suit and a tie, right? They're interconnected to our markets, to our media information systems. We're all interconnected in this post-Cold War era. Um, so, that, so basically the point is that the Iron Fist now wears a velvet glove, right? But it's, the, it's still the same enemy of freedom, right? So in this, in this modern era, what basically the point that I've come to is just that freedom and authoritarianism are just simply incompatible. But yet we are completely interconnected through markets, media, every other way you can possibly think about it. So there has to be a new way to think about this and a new way to get at it. So getting to how this, how this uh, goes to the misrule of law and, and Russia, um, Vladimir Putin's net worth is estimated by many to be well over a hundred billion dollars. A hundred to a hundred and sixty billion dollars of net worth hidden all around the world in different places. Uh, you can do, imagine what you can do with that much money if you were in control of it, right? So that means there's like no real simple one solution to anything of where that money can go, what it can be used to, used for. Money is very fungible, right? It can be turned into to anything. So if you have that much value under your control, um, you can do pretty much anything, but this, this is a discretionary fund, right? It gets back to my research. This is how modern authoritarian leaders survive in office, right? So if you have that large of a discretionary uh, uh, fund uh, built off of criminal activity, um, it can't simply be squashed just, just with a state action. Um, 
But there are simple steps that can be taken, right? Economic transparency, uh, essentially dealing with anonymous shell companies, which are basically the pack horse mules for most of this money laundering going around the world that's used to funnel this, these, this, this discretionary fund around and used uh, for different purposes, could be taken care of, right? That, that's a very simple, pragmatic uh, first step, I think, in, in doing it. But there's lots of other great ideas that I've heard outlined here, but ultimately what it's going to take is some type of moral leadership, right? And the United States uh, basically standing up and defending freedom and democracy again around the world, having the moral courage to really take seriously standing up for the people who cannot be in the room. And like some of the other speakers have, have said, a lot of that starts with fixing things at home. Um, mostly relating to economic policy and uh, uh, notions of, of, of economic transparency and functioning markets, democratic capitalism, privacy rights, uh, election rules. I mean, these basic getting back to the back to the basics. Um, so essentially, uh, I think this is. I think it's 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 very doable. I think it just takes everybody getting on the same page and learning how to talk about it. Uh, uh, right. So I want to commend uh, uh, Free Russia and Human Rights and all the groups for and all the speakers today for bringing this together. I, I, I want to commend you for your moral courage, uh, for your hard work uh, in this, and thank you for inviting me here to speak. Clay, thank you. Thank you for stepping back also and sort of putting it in that in that context. That's very helpful. Something for all of us to remember. Now we've spoken about various. Um, people speaking and teaching at university. So I should mention that Anna's a PhD candidate at George Mason, so she is in the midst of that very long slog. So we wish you well in that. <laughs> and also, as I mentioned before, her focus has been on Russia and policy in the Middle East. Um, so I look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. And sorry that I missed the first, uh, first session. Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. And um, I won't talk about the Middle East unless you want me to. I'll focus on, on the West. Um, uh, um, I'm going to start with just uh, a couple of very brief, uh, very broad strategic uh, objectives, very broad, big picture things. And that is, uh, when you look at the Kremlin regime, um, I think it has three priorities. One is regime survival, I think that's the number one. Um, uh, dominance of the near abroad, I think is two. And the second, uh, probably the least discussed, is global recognition of Russia as a great power. We certainly focus a lot on Russia in Europe and the near abroad, but there's also a global dimension to that as well. Um, um, I'm going to focus on the subset of these issues, that is uh, exertion of influence shaping political processes in the West in the post-Soviet space, primarily through uh, so-called gondo pseudo-NGOs and, and propaganda messages that they, that they spread. Um, and again, it's important to remember that Moscow employs a whole package of tools and that they work together, and I'm only focusing on one. Uh, another caveat is that uh, a lot of these Russian activities are covert, so there's still a lot we, we don't, we know quite a bit, but there's still a lot we don't know. Um, uh, and a last caveat is that when we talk about NGOs, uh, government-sponsored NGOs, it's important to remember that in democratic societies there are government-funded NGOs, um, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, but it's a completely different uh, situation, and that's why I want to highlight this. In democratic governments, uh, these are transparent organizations that are open about their activities, they're open about their funding, they're open about their mission, um, and they operate in a competitive open process. Uh, with Russia, everything that happens is opaque and subversive. Uh, so it, it's, it's fair to say uh, that the West also funds government, non-government organizations, but the context is completely different. Uh, so what these organizations do um, is they try to influence through uh, a number of, uh, of tactics, such as one is the divide and rule, uh, looking at fissures in, in societies, and this has been mentioned in previous presentations as well, uh, looking to gain intelligence uh, also, for example, in uh, 2014, after annexation of Crimea, uh, Russian intelligence uh, services who were operating in these organizations uh, reportedly were tasked to find out, for example, what it would take to get sanctions lifted, what, it, what, what the German government, for example, might find uh, unacceptable, sort of what are the red lines. Uh, which are often important for the Kremlin. Uh, how would um, e uh, the American and European governments handle, for example, an escalation of conflict and so forth? 
Um, there are, it's a complete set of, a com complex set of organizations. There are reportedly hundreds of them operating. A lot of them are under the, uh, the rubric of Rostotrudnichistvo, which was um, created in the mid 2000s as part of Russia's um, uh, emphasis on soft power, um, the Russian world, and a whole other area of think tanks and foundations. Um, they often promote Kremlin narratives. Um, they uh, distort uh, history, which is a, the usual Kremlin, uh, frankly, uh, uh, pass passing of time. This is, not, uh, this is not just NGOs, and this is not new. Um, with regard to deepening social issues, uh, they look at uh, such topics as minorities, refugees in Europe. This has been a very big issue in Europe. Uh, support for extremist far right and far left views. Um, sometimes sponsoring protests on select target issues. And I, I think everybody, uh, or the majority of people remember the story of, of Lisa, this fake story that was created in Germany um, uh, about a Russian uh, immigrant in Germany who was supposedly raped by uh, Arab-looking uh, immigrants, right? And, and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov very emotionally talked about it as our Lisa. There was this emotional component of our Lisa. Uh, the story turned out to be completely false. Um, but it's narratives like this, uh, even when they fail, that seep into the consciousness and, and exacerbate the existing, uh, existing uh, tensions and fissures. Um, there's another example, the World National Conservative Movement, an international uh, movement of uh, radical anti-immigration activists uh, that reportedly the Kremlin funded to put pressure on European governments to reform their immigration policy. Um, in Lithuania, there was a, um, an event where school children were set up uh, in this team of called a striking battalion of death. They participated in these military uh, simulation exercises. Um, there were groups that were sponsored uh, in events that um, uh, did passport burning uh, and anti-LGBT protests. Um, uh, you know, soccer hooligans, the, these famous biker gangs that we read a lot about, right? The night wolves, um, and all sorts of other groups that cause destruction, uh, disruptions. And frankly, sometimes uh, uh, these are very small minority groups. That they're so small that it's hard to even call it a protest. Sometimes it's only one or two people, but but it has, <laughs> it's not really a protest if it's one person. But um, but they, they they gather this this momentum through uh, through these organizations, through the media that gets picked up and exaggerated. Um, there were even reports indicated that Moscow supported environmental groups in the U.S. and Europe uh, to influence the Western energy policy. So, um, and mi uh, many individuals who get recruited by these organizations uh, uh, often serve as unwitting accomplices. They don't understand that they're being used. Um, and I'll say in conclusion, uh, in the interest of saving time, um, sometimes these efforts do fire, uh, do, do backfire on Germany, uh, because there is greater awareness now of of, the, of this, these Russian activities. We're holding more and more of events like this that expose uh, what the Kremlin is doing. Um, but I, I think because we still don't know the full extent of these networks, this, these are still very covert uh, activities. More of of um, exposure is needed. Um, this, is, uh, this is not to say we need to get hysterical, but we need to take these efforts very seriously uh, and act to counter them. Uh, we certainly talked, uh, other speakers have mentioned our own internal problems. I think on issues such as refugees, minorities, and other societal fissures, that is especially important. We're also, we, as democracies, there is a broader crisis within democracies, and that makes it easier for, for Putin to step in and exacerbate these fissures. So certainly, at the interest of re repeating what others have said, uh, healing our own internal uh, divisions will make it uh, uh, harder for Putin to um, to cash in on our own existing problems. Thank you. Kenna, thank you very much. And, and you really raise an interesting, vital point, which is the role of um, what role there is in terms of state sponsor support for these um, different, you know, what we, we could call them NGOs or interest groups or organizations and a, um, from my perspective, a dangerous um, attempt to create a moral equivalence between you know, foundation work sponsored by the West and those activities that are sponsored with a very specific political objective um, to achieve. So thank you for highlighting that for us. We have 15 minutes for questions, and so as we did last time, what I'd like to do is, is take a series of questions and then open it up to our panel to respond. So do we have questions? that working? Question here in the back. And please, again, introduce yourself and um, focus on questions, not on um, speeches. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Nathaniel Beach. I'm an intern uh, with Congressman Steve Stivers. 
Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Fuller, but anybody on the panel is more than welcome to give their opinions as well. So um, I've recently read a lot of the work of Hannah Arendt um, and kind of the rise of uh, authoritarian and oppressive regimes. And I guess my kind of question is, in her writing and a few other theorists as well, they tend to think that oppressive regimes kind of start and go and end in a similar fashion, that they kind of have a similar-ish pattern. Granted, hers is more focused on Nazi Germany and regimes from the past. But I guess the question is, do you see Russia following a similar path and moving forward? Is there any predictions you guys can make regarding uh, where Russia, China, or any of the other oppressive regimes in the world today are kind of going? Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Dave Loudon, I'm a retired intelligence analyst. Uh, this question is for uh, Professor Limero and uh, Dr. Fuller, but anyone also. Um, what what efforts are we making to uh, impact that uh, that uh, integration of cultures? Uh, um, for example, we we face similar problems, and, but apparently have reacted quite different to it with uh, German Americans in World War II. So, are we? Are, is there enough emphasis on intercultural exchanges amongst uh, amongst uh, uh, nations, uh, where we bring their students here, our students go there? Obviously, with some oversight to make sure that that manipulation that you've discussed doesn't take place. Thank you. Question in the back. Hi there, Evan Corcoran. Um, this question is probably specifically for the final speaker, Anna. Um, I was wondering if you can give some insight as to some of the tactics you described that the Russian government uses in Western Europe, um, in Turkey, a um, country that sits on the periphery of the West and the Middle East. Thank you. We have one more. Any other questions? One more, perhaps? You. Yes. Others, too. Hi. I'm Corinna Rebeja. I'm with SIPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis. Um, one of the things that we looked at and actually came through in the discussion today is that there is still a um, sort of a perception divide between Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe when it comes to Russian influence. Um, and um, I was wondering if Martin or Jakub or anyone in the panel could really speak to that, whether naming and, and shaming can work, whether sanctions can actually work in the long run, and how we can bridge that divide. Thank you. I think we had one more. Thank you all for your comments today. I'm, my name is Callahan Staub. I'm a student at Hillsdale College. And this direction, or this is directed at Jacob, but anyone can answer. It seems that there's a chicken and egg phenomenon on free governments and the ability for people to speak out. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on how we can bridge the gap of getting people to speak out when they are um, afraid of the implications of speaking out, as we heard this morning in the earlier examples of the <coughs> repercussions that they face. Okay, so we received a whole series of easy yes or no questions, so I turn it over to panelists to answer. <laughs> I can start with a question of uh, Hannah Arendt and totalitarianism, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, so so that's so that's a great work, and that's where a lot of people start out. But where I distinguished my course in looking at this was focusing on there, there's a distinct literature of we call it comparative authoritarianism that's come out in the past maybe. 10, 10 years, and one strand of that strand is heavily empirical and focuses on methods and counting and looking for specific trends worldwide. So it doesn't have a specific country focus, it doesn't have a specific culture focus or anything, it looks at the entire world. And yes, there are very clear trends. Um, however, you classify dictatorships or non-democracies, they're involved in every single war. Um, they're, they're typically in just as violently as they begin. Uh, transitions, regime change, right, tends to be dictatorship to dictatorship more than it's ever dictatorship to democracy. So regimes are always churning in dictatorships, but we tend to only count it when they transition to a democracy. But if you count it as dictatorship to dictatorship, that's the most common uh, form that we see all the time. We see the worst cases of genocide, of human rights violations, of market manipulation. I mean, the, the trends are all over the place and it all points towards not good. 
Um, and uh, especially since we're getting a more uh, sort of equal distribution of GDP and economic productivity between free and, and, and not free countries. Um, not free countries, uh, you can look at Algeria, Sudan, you could look at the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Uh, nobody knew this was coming. Very few people were expecting it, and it usually happens like, like that. You know, we've been talking about democratic decline in the U.S. for, what, 13 years straight now, and people are still questioning, like, is it really happening or is it not? Something's happening. What, is it really something? Right? Uh, but so that's how democracies sort of flux in and out. But in an authoritarian regime, you wake up the next morning and the government's gone. That's really bad for markets, especially when they're globally connected and we have these really complex supply chains going all over the world. Uh, investment funds, all you know, we depend on that stability, and we just we're not, we're not gonna we're not gonna have it. So yes, there are very common trends uh, among, it. and the, the the thing that's different from Arendt's analysis is that the ideology is gone. The 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 pan communism or the the whatever it is, the Nazism or the the grand ideologies. They're there in small places, but they're culturally specific and state specific, and they don't interconnect and they don't spread out of the borders. You know, Juche in North Korea, self-reliance, or whatever, or Xi Jinping thought or something, it doesn't work anywhere except where, it, where it's at, and it can't cooperate with other ones. Whereas communism, totalitarianism, actively sought to spread around the world and take over the world. That's gone. So now you just have these disparate ideologies. So, so ideology just doesn't play the same role that it used to. It's, it's markets and economics now. Thank you. And um, not to play the jaded, jaded older person here, but um, if the ideology is basically power first, the rest of it is just kind of rhetoric underneath. But that's yeah. my own commentary. We have other questions. <laughs> I mean, other responses, please. Okay, I'll answer two of the questions. One on Central Europe versus Central Eastern Europe, let's say, the division of perception. We do a thing annually called Kremlin Watch Ranking, where we look into EU member states, so 28 countries, or still 28, let's say, um, where we are looking over how do they respond to Russian influence activities in their own territory. Do they have policies? Do they have political consensus on this? How does it change? We do it annually. Let's say the big bottom line from this is that there is a dividing line, and more or less countries which do understand and respond to Russian malign influence are more or less sitting in Central Eastern Europe, which means practically that those are countries which are small to mid-size, with some exceptions like Poland, countries which are relatively poor compared to Western Europe, and countries which are effectively getting money from the EU budget, not paying to it because of the structural differences. So, uh, and then, then there is the UK, which is a specific case at this moment, uh, which practically means that the countries which are more or less not getting uh, the Russian threat, or I would say in general they, they are not getting it, uh, let's say Germany, France, Italy, Spain, those countries, uh, they, are, they are, let's say, dominant inside of EU politics because of their size, because of their history as well. Uh, but the result is that there are 10 to 12 EU member states, which more or less are pushing uh, back or trying to push, push back against Russia, but they are pretty much weak, poor, and more or less less respected than the bigger ones. That's the state of play we are in, more or less, inside of the EU. It doesn't change much over year to year. There are small changes where countries got hit. For example, Spain during the Catalonia crisis with some Russian links in there. The government woke up in, in Madrid for a couple of months, then it's gone. No, no, no major pushback against Russia from Madrid at this moment. Uh, similar country to country. So more or less what we could conclude is no matter what kind of hostilities the Russian, the Russian government does inside Europe, and I'm not speaking about Ukraine or Georgia, really the non-military hostilities, like for example the Skripal case, chemical attack inside of the UK, major espionage cases in the Netherlands, there are dozens of other examples, Russia doesn't get punished, and more or less those, uh, let's say, continental Western European ca uh, countries are not getting uh, to the bottom of this. They are not getting, they are not getting uh, their defenses up against Russian malign influence for various reasons, but they are not, at least in, in the last three, four years. The second answer I would give uh, over are we getting enough of naming and shaming, I'm not saying this is the only reason, but if you look specifically inside Germany, Spain, Italy, France, those major countries in Western Europe, 
What you don't have are, let's say, specialized NGOs, specialized non-governmental organizations academic institu or academic institutions, which are really digging into practicalities, empirical evidence over Russian influence activities. You don't have a specific think tank on this in Berlin, for example. They are just individuals who are trying their best, but there is basically a very little number of people doing this. The result is not only little evidence is public, sometimes it is thanks to some of the brave media, but you don't have pub uh, advocacy players, let's say like ourselves in our countries or our, our regions, who are pushing it hard in the domestic cases there, in Germany, France, Italy, other countries. So, at, so the result of this at the end is that you would have Gerhard Schroeder being paid by Russia as a keynote speaker of the SPD convention, a German central left political party two or three years ago. Basically a Russian proxy, but being a keynote speaker of a major governing political party at their convention. How is this Thanks, I just want right. to make sure oh. we get to the okay. so I just want to add to Corina's uh, question and Jakub's comments. Um, over the last couple of years, we uh, in Kremlin Playbook 1 and Kremlin Playbook 2, we analyzed 15 countries uh, in Europe. And I would say that there is not much difference between Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe in terms of the Russian mechanisms of uh, expanding their economic sure. presence. And I would say that actually over the last three decades, what we've seen in Europe is a very deep economic integration uh, of Russian capital within European Western, European financial uh, system. And this integration has been used, I think, very targetedly uh, uh, to develop networks, oligarchic networks within each of these countries that we've studied. And I think the threat is even bigger in Western Europe than in Central and Eastern Europe. Why am I saying that? Because Western Europe is where Russia uses financial centers like Luxembourg, like Netherlands, like Austria, to actually rechannel and reallocate funds and capital back into Central and Eastern Europe and back to Russia to finance strategic acquisitions with political implications, to finance political parties, to finance media. Uh, and unless this uh, integration of very often illicit funds within the Western European financial system is stopped or at least regulated more vigorously, it will be very difficult to stop the expanding and entrenching of Russian interests within Europe. That's why the response of European countries, both in the West and I would say in, in, in the East, have been so uh, um, weak. It's been more rhetorical uh, and sanctions have been more rhetorical than actually practical. Uh, but this is because of this integration. Thank you. Anna. Sure, I just I want to answer the question on Turkey. Thank you for the question. It's it's a very important one. Um, Russia has um, multiple uh, levers of influence in Turkey, uh, and frankly, I'm not sure if Erdogan himself is realizing it. Just how how deep it goes. Um, specifically, more in along the lines of the types of influence that I was talking about in my presentation, um, Russian tourists uh, uh, have been. Uh, Turkey has been a top destination for Russian tourists uh, for years now, uh, with the small exception of what happened after the Russian, um, uh, sorry, the Turkish downing of Russian plane uh, in Syria in, 2000, in late 2015. Um, that's, uh, and again, because we're talking about the Kremlin uh, in, a, in a democratic uh, society, you know, you, you don't think much about tourism, but again, for, for an authoritarian state, that's a lever of influence. Uh, business, business ties, very deep business ties. Um, virtually every country in the Middle East, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, in the post-Soviet space, but also in the Middle East, has a Russian cultural center. Uh, and uh, I don't know for sure if it exists in Turkey, I just haven't explored that issue, but I suspect there is one there as well. Um, uh, Sputnik. Uh, especially Radio Sputnik uh, has taken on a major role in Turkey uh, and uh, the, the way to understand this also is the, the, the media space in Turkey itself. Uh, Turkey has at this point more journalists jailed than even Russia uh, and that's pretty hard to do. And um, because, uh, you know, I was told personally that some of the best Turkish journalists had gone to work uh, for Sputnik. Uh, in, it's also perceived, uh, many in Turkey perceive Sputnik as the only independent outlet because of the already authoritarian and controlled it's media like environment in Turkey. Um, like what's also interesting is Sputnik uh, likes to, uh, so Sputnik itself is not pro Erdogan necessarily. In fact, it, it often, uh, again, plays on societal tensions, and Turkey is a very divided country and always has been. Um, and uh, it, it oftentimes is anti Erdogan. Uh, 
in a way sending a signal to let them know that they're there. Uh, so the influence, uh, the, the multiple channels of influence, I haven't even touched on the, the S-400 uh, saga and so forth, and it's a really important issue, and it'll get worse. Thank you. Jeremy, I'll give you the last word. Okay, I just wanted to answer the question about what we're doing to facilitate integration. Uh, I'm not aware that we're doing a lot, actually. Um, I, we, we obviously encourage it, but I don't think we've been doing much of that. And one of the challenges is that in encouraging integration, we're being somewhat hypocritical because of the tribalism. Um, and, 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 and Clay mentioned this, and some other people have mentioned this. In the West, we're so tribalistic that encouraging integration elsewhere is, is, is somewhat hypocritical. But because we are uh, such a, because the United States and NATO and the EU are such significant players in Eastern Europe, especially the Baltic states, I think we can make a claim that we, that we can, ex we should expect them to sort of fall in line in some things. And if we really wanted them to, to uh, broaden their, uh, broaden their citizenship and their language laws, I think we should and could pressure them a bit more. Thank you. Okay, so we will um, conclude this panel. We'll take a 10-minute break. We'll come right back to it. And please join me in thanking our really outstanding speakers. I'm not sure if it's still up. It's possible to implement it. But you can email me. I can send you some of the my work that I've done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. Thanks for the question. Great to meet you. No, but so, um, yeah, they, they've developed their own transparency measure. So I'm just going to tell the investors how much they want to do with the
Fantastic. It's very under The former Russian ambassador to the power EU accession in 2026. He said that Bulgaria be our Georgian, meaning Russian, but he added that. Ah, I mean, it's a good question for you. But, you know, uh, a decade before after that, I think he was perfectly right. Because Bulgaria, So I thought we'll go down the road again. No, no, I'm just. If I switch it up, I'll switch it up. Yeah. If people could retake their seats, we're going to begin the third panel. Yeah, he teaches. He was teaching there for time. We're going to begin the third panel. If people wouldn't mind taking their seats now. 
Okay, so I want to thank you for staying with us. As, as we mentioned earlier, um, we know we're covering a lot of material in a brief period of time, so um, we're very appreciative of the time you're, you're giving us today. Our earlier panels, we, we heard about sort of the above the line challenges legal institutions are facing, and then the below lines soft power active measures pieces that are going on in terms of influencing Ru Russian activities, um, trying to undermine institutions at a cultural, social level as well, and in a business level. So now we come to our third panel. Our third panel is going to focus in on um, what do we do about it? Um, how do we counter sort of soft power attacks? Um, how do we have spoken about the fissures in societies? And how do we both, I suppose, mend ourselves, although the focus here will be, I think, a little bit more on uh, specific policies um, toward recognizing where we have those fissures and, and where we might be able to to tighten things up a little bit. Um, we're also going to have a bit of a discussion on technology and in, in going into that I just want to make sure from my own perspective is we tend to have a very black and white view on, on technology fixes of it's either all technology's fault um, and they need to fix it or this is impossible to fix when in fact it's very much a, a, a combination of, of different variables and um, the challenges of an algorithm will take us um, so far in, in the patching side of things. We have um, on this panel Mr. Andrew Gully from Jigsaw. He's the head of R&D there, which is um, Jigsaw is, is, is Google. Uh, Roman uh, Pathkoff, who's headquarters at the Air Force, checkmate at the Pentagon. Uh, Krista Talbert, who heads uh, World News and Current Affairs uh, for Finland. Brian Bender, who's the editor, um, defense editor of Politico. Um, Brian, I need your help on getting some of my op-eds published. Thank you. <laughs> Chris, uh, Chris Marsh from Joint Special Operations University as well. And so we'll go down the row again. And um, again, our, our format will be about seven minutes each for presentations, leaving a little bit of time for the speakers. Um, Andrew will go first. I will just mention one thing about Andrew that should give hope to people like me. He has a background. His, his degrees, I see, are in um, religious studies and Middle Eastern studies. And I was a political philosophy major myself. You've gone on to Jigsaw, um, so you give me hope if I still want to jump oh, another direction. That's right. Yeah, so please. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Natalia, and to the Free Russia Foundation for having me here and inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, it's really exciting. I must say, though, as the sole representative, I think at least, of the tech company of the tech companies here, um, I think I feel a little bit out of place. Nevertheless, um, it's really great to be here, and I do hope to contribute to this discussion, as Todd had mentioned, from the technology um, perspective. So, I'm going to not really discuss any specific policy objectives, but really key in on how um, the, what the technology interventions might might use we might be able to use in this space. First, though, I think it might be helpful for me to explain a little bit about our organization um, and why we care about this issue. So as Todd mentioned, I'm from Jigsaw. Jigsaw is actually just a brief uh, clarification. We're not Google. We're an alphabet company, um, which, of course, is where no worries. <laughs> um, so we're an alphabet company. Our mission is to build technology to help vulnerable people online. So that may be people facing targeted online harassment of some form. They're suffering from uh, uh, repressive online censorship. If they live in, a re in under a regime where they're unable to access the free and open internet, we're helping users there. And of course, which is why we're here today, um, facing threats of online disinformation from Russia or a variety of other state or non-state actors. So um, one thing I'll say is at the risk of sounding a little bit out of place here at a countering um, Russian disinformation event, I would like to challenge us at least a little bit to try to open the aperture just slightly. And the reason for that is because at Jigsaw, uh, my team at least, um, we tend not to think about the problem through an actor-specific lens. Um, we're really trying to t think more about tactics and reverse engineering those tactics and from there think about what are the solutions that we can use that apply to a multitude of adversaries. That being said, um, we, like many others, were introduced to this problem through studying and tracking the activities of the Kremlin and the Internet Research Agency in the context of the 2016 elections. And I'm really proud to say that my team was among the first who were tracking some of this activity that ultimately led to the widespread uh, takedowns and um, 
uh, exposure of these networks in the late 2017. Um, but I won't really get into that uh, unless there's specific questions about it that's been covered extensively in the press. Um, so let me discuss more like how we're seeing this threat today. If I think I could sum it up in a single phrase, I might say that I believe uh, disinformation as a tactic has metastasized. So like a cancer that has spread to other parts of the body, so is disinformation as a tactic spread to, uh, to other actors and nations globally who are now embracing it as an effective means by which they're using to shape international or domestic policies. Last year, I think it was the Freedom House, if I'm not mistaken, who reported um, earlier in 2018 in one of their annual reports that some 30 or more countries had experienced some form of social media or online election interference. And as of last year, our partner, us and our partners had documented the existence of a large scale um, a disinformation campaign targeting U.S. and global audiences that was emanating from Iran. So I think what we can conclude from this analysis is that um, among the least uh, state adversaries at least, and certainly non-state adversaries, um, but there seems to be a bit of a feed loop uh, mechanism whereby state actors are learning from each other, they're adapting their tactics, and they're evolving to get past some of the safeguards um, more and more that platforms and other policies are putting in place to try to prevent these sorts of attacks on our democracies. But of course, the state actor who has demonstrated the most expertise in this area clearly is Russia. And others are learning from their successes. As I already mentioned, Iran, as we uh, as we'll talk about. Um, but if you look at the material, really, that Iran had been promoting, you see fake news websites. You see hyperpartisan content disseminated from social media accounts. These are playbooks that are taken directly. These are plays that are taken directly from the Russian playbook. But it's not only Iran. We see the Gulf states, for instance, um, engaging in hack and leak operations in order to justify their agendas. And the list goes on. But this is a really difficult and pernicious problem, the one about uh, especially online disinformation. And we've made some advances to be sure, but I think it's worth saying that, and as Todd even mentioned, and I wholly agree, that this is really going to take a whole society approach. We have policy um, interventions, we have intelligence and military ones, and of course there's technology solutions as well. I think disinformation is particularly pernicious and particularly challenging because it's difficult structurally. These type of attacks are often not embedded within some sort of other illegal activity, such as cyber intrusions. And for the most part, the content that is being spread by many adversaries, if it were coming from an American, we would largely agree that that would be protected by free speech. So it brings up these numerous free speech um, concerns as well. And it also sits in a bit of a gray area among news publishers that can be challenging for um, platforms to accurately assess um, from a platform policy perspective. So all this to say is that disinformation is a very difficult problem to solve. And of course, Russia knows this, and that's why they're really good at it. So my organization at Jigsaw, we see disinformation, our work really sits on three separate pillars. The first involves what I broadly would define and characterize as intelligence collection. Um, we're constantly outsourcing leads from a variety of um, useful and interesting um, uh, locations and actors in order to not only inform our thinking, but also inform us to the tactics that adversaries are using um, right now. Secondly, we venture to deeply understand the cognitive and social science and behavior behind why people believe in and uh, take actions after viewing different types of disinformation. Now, this might sound a little bit academic, and in some ways it is, but I actually think it's crucial, and I think it's in this domain of research that we're actually going to have some potential to have some um, real impact here. Um, but I will assure you that the literature in this regard on the cognitive science doesn't always paint a particularly optimistic picture. The more people, the more information people are exposed to, and with increasing frequency, increases the likelihood that they're going to believe it. People tend to believe information more strongly if it's presented to them from uh, peer groups inside your social network. And um, also if people are exposed to fact checks or retractions, they often don't believe it or, or rather forget that um, correction weeks or, or days or even weeks later. Um, but it's, this is really important because these are all aspects that our adversaries know and our adversaries are exploiting. And we can see this, right? Russia pummels us with, repeat, with repeating the same message from multiple outlets and multiple angle, angles, which confuses the reader to a truth. Through social media, they're infiltrating our peer networks and to see tailor-made content directly into your social circle, into your social graph that's hacking the very um, way and mechanisms in which these platforms are operating, designed to operate. And they rely on the fact that it's really difficult to scale fact-checking initiatives. And it's, all, and it's, as I mentioned, it's extremely difficult to get them to stick. 
I think if we don't pay enough attention to how disinformation is exploiting our weaknesses, especially cognitively, we're missing the picture. So finally, in my organization, once we've collected the data, once we've understood the adversary's tactics, and we've understood how to, or we're trying to understand how to counter it experimentally, for us, it's time to build. So right now, we're investing in a variety of products that are leveraging these, these types of insights that I mentioned to help users. Right now, we're deeply interested in the problem of manipulated and synthetic media. Um, deepfakes is a term, actually, there's a hearing right now, I think, on the Hill um, on this issue, um, as well as countering disinformation as it occurs on private messaging applications and within tight social circles, um, because that is particularly pernicious, pernicious because the trust level is so much higher. Um, I'd also like to address an earlier point that was raised on the on the importance that I think, the relative importance that's being portrayed in the media and perhaps at other events, not, not exactly like this, but others similar to it, um, about how we're weighing the technology aspect. I actually couldn't agree with that more. I think technology is just simply one aspect of a broader threat that includes political, economic, and also more routine um, disinformation that is spreading through a variety of print um, and traditional media. Um, but the threats are multifaceted, and so they require a multifaceted approach. So I hope that I'm able to contribute, and the organization is able to contribute specifically to the technology, uh, technological aspect. Not that it's more important, not about that it is a important um, uh, pillar of, of, of the threat. Um, so I think I'll just stop here. I've covered a lot of ground, and I hope that we can get into some more of the specifics during the Q&A. Um, and I'll go ahead and look for the rest of my Andrew, thank you. So if I heard you right, you're going to be sending out a patch that's going to correct everything very quickly. Thank you. So Roman is a subject matter expert on Russia at the Pentagon. Um, his, his focus and expertise really has been on the air power side of, of things in terms of um, focusing in on, on air power's role in supporting the national defense strategy um, and the national military strategy. And he's going to really bring to us, I think, a lot of perspective um, from a, a planning standpoint. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me over here. And uh, before I begin, I do want to say, so uh, these are my views. They don't represent the Department of Defense or the Department of the Air Force. Uh, so as uh, <clears throat> you think about Russia and uh, things that they have done, right, the first thing, as with any problem, you got to recognize there is a problem. And I think that 2014 was our really first wake-up call of, Russia is doing something that was Ukraine that wasn't directly attributed to us. But then the 2016 election was the other uh, highlight of Russian actions and the way they view uh, their relationship with the United States. And so as you think about it and you realize Russia has done these things, as you look back through our relationship with Russia prior to that, you really can see that it really was not that big of a change from their perspective just because of the way they talked about in 2000 about changing the, multi the unipolar world to a multipolar world, about their actions in uh, Ukraine in 2006 and then Britain in 2006 with poisoning the FSB agent, uh, former FSB agent. And so as uh, you look at it broadly, uh, you realize that Russia, as our strategic guidance kind of re uh, layout, is, it is involved in the competition with us, right? We call it the great power competition. Uh, there's definitely, uh, I do think that Russia is a competitor, but their ability and they are not at the level of the United States. However, in the information, in the environment we exist today, it doesn't require them to be at our level to actually do things that could negatively impact our interests. And so, uh, first thing after you understand there is a problem, right, you need expertise. And that's what we kind of, by the time, by, between the end of the Cold War, and between Russia again becoming a problem, we kind of lost that. There was a lot of Soviet expertise, a lot of stuff developed to understand how Soviet Union thought. And we lost that as because we refocused on other things in the world. And so before we started addressing things or going depth in, uh, too much into detail of things we're gonna do, you gotta restore that expertise. You gotta get the folks to understand what Russia is, what kind of country it is, what the regime is, what their goals are. And so you can understand, so then you can bring that perspective to problem, how you're going to solve these issues and how you're going to address them. As you look at the, so there was mentioned, you know, like Interpol, for example, uh, as you look at it from a uh, Russia using the institutions, uh, Western institutions for its own means, if you understand Russia, there should be no surprise to you that Interpol is being used that way because that's what Russia would do because that's what they do inside their own country. And therefore, there should be no surprise that Western institutions will be used for this purpose by the countries that do not subscribe to the same 
uh, rule of law and uh, the same uh, Western values that we do. From the Russia perspective, <clears throat> Russia prospers, right, in places where there's corruption, places where there is a uh, lack of rule of law and where there's no transparency, right? So those things are not just uh, um, unique specifically to just certain parts of the world, like maybe Eastern Europe or other areas, but if, uh, if not addressed, throughout the rest of the other uh, United States or our allies can be exploited by Russia to achieve its objective. So as we look at it, the plan, uh, the not the solution, but the way you go about it is strengthening those things, right? So anti-corruption assisting countries in Eastern Europe with uh, uh, to root out corruption, freedom of the press, rule of law. Those things once F, if strengthened to present a um, a uh, deterrent and a counter to Russian activities. Unlike the USSR, Russia is also heavily integrated with the West. The USSR was very much a country in a world of its own, whereas Russia is very integrated with the West. As talked about before, it uses financial systems, and that's one of the key possibly levers that could be used uh, to address Russian activities is to uh, Look at those specific places where Russia takes advantage of the laws that do not allow uh, transparency and allow money to be used anonymously for nefarious purposes and expose and then cut off those uh, sources of income. As, um, as Russia demonstrated, uh, I actually think it's kind of in every uh, crisis there's an opportunity. I think it re really, for the whole of our um, kind of government, woke everybody up as, um, and highlighted the need to really refocus our energy and understand that just because Russia did it doesn't mean somebody else is not going to do it. And if Russia tomorrow goes away and there's no longer a country that is uh, conducting actions that are detrimental to U.S. interests, doesn't mean another country such as China or whoever else comes up will not be able to exploit the same flaws. So the things we do to address Russian uh, actions in the United States and against our U.S. interests around the world is the same things that would allow us to uh, mitigate any potential future adversary and their use of those similar events and actions around the world. And so as uh, it allows us to do that, there's of course room for uh, as uh, technological solutions, but there's room uh, also for possibly just educational and refocusing of where we're going. So if you educate and if you expose and you build the core expertise of what Russia does, combined with uh, strengthening things that make us a great country. Therefore, you will allow, or you will be able to uh, not prevent, but you'll be able to mitigate the bad things that Russia does. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's um, very helpful. And it, it is, of course, always a challenge um, in terms of speaking from this within the context of the Pentagon right. in the larger planning environment. So thank you for doing that. Um, Krista Talbert, who I mentioned, she's head of world news and current affairs for Finnish Broadcasting, and she leads a department and network of 30 foreign um, news journalists, eight correspondents, and 12 stringers worldwide. Uh, she was previously anchored um, the uh, TV and current affairs show in Finland called A Studio, and I was in Norway myself a couple weeks ago. I could confirm it's still cold there this time of year. So, <laughs> Krista, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the organizers for a very important event, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. As Finnish broadcasting company probably is unheard of you before, I will mention a little bit about it. Um, it's a public broadcasting company, and, and um, uh, we have uh, uh, the most extensive and varied uh, online selection on TV and radio programming and uh, the public considers us a very reliable source of news and current affairs. And, and to get an idea of, of the relevance, uh, in 2017, Wiley, the Finnish broadcasting company, managed to reach everything. So, so that's the, the company. We are a small country, though, yeah. <laughs> but um, I will go a little bit further back in the history as uh, I live in quite a unique country uh, and uh, I will then try to um, explain why our resilience comes 
far back from the history. And it's very much on owning the national narrative. Uh, and for a very long time, we Finns have strongly identified ourselves as Europeans and Westerners, and we have very close ties to other Nordic countries. Uh, our society is built in a similar way based on the Swedish concept of welfare state. Finland is also a neighbor of Russia with 800 mile, over 800 mile border, long border and, and mutually respectful and friendly relations. But this was not always the case. Uh, animosity between the two nations has a long history and it culminated in two wars between uh, 1939 and 1944 with Finland losing both times, though without losing its independence. After the wars having lost tenth of its area, Finland had to sign a treaty of friendship, cooperation and mutual military assistance with Moscow. But we were never an exit to the Soviet Union, not even to so-called Soviet bloc. And the paragraph about the mutual military assistance was never applied. Finland tried to balance its relations with the Soviet Union and function as a neutral country between East and West. Unfortunately, the relationship was not always the equal, equal one because the Soviets didn't approve of Finland's neutrality until 1989 when Gorbachev finally acquiesced to it. Uh, but our history and geopolitical location has taught us very many valuable lessons how to defend our core values towards the threats we might face. And uh, I think it's important to remind once again that, that uh, as it's said many times earlier, that the threats come from all directions, that it's not just Russia, that we have to be alert about the other uh, possible threats as well. So the today's resilience with Finland uh, uh, is based on a certain uh, 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 critical uh, aspects and uh, one of those is, is that Finland is and has been a market economy. Uh, Finland is an active member of European Union and we use Euro as our currency and we are NATO partners. Uh, the very foundation of our resistance is an open society, high trust in solid and well-functioning institutions, strong commitment to equality and educated population. Uh, you might have heard from news even in here that Finland tops in many international rankings. Just to mention a few, we are one of the least corrupt countries in the world and one of the best countries on transparency and innovation. And we have a very uh, famous, I would say famous, and a, a excellent public education system that tops the world at, at many comparisons. Uh, most Finns have fluency in other languages, just as their mother tongue, and we've ranked top on the annual press freedom index. The role of the diverse and robust media landscape is also very, very important for their resilience. And, um, and is the importance, importance of inclusiveness of minorities. Uh, Finnish Broadcasting Company, where I work, uh, has an internet and broadcasting services, for example, in Russian. Uh, we even have a TV newscast in Russian. And the idea is that, uh, that it's crucial that the Russian-speaking minority would know what is happening in Finland and get the information that is uh, based on facts and uh, that they would know what is happening in Finland and what they might then think about different issues. And especially what are the values and the basis how the society functions. So this is who we are. And, uh, and then we have the neighbor. And um, there have been, I've, I've raised a couple of uh, cases. There are um, certainly, uh, um, many to uh, look closer at, uh, or dozens to look closer at, but I will mention a few, and these have been very well covered in the, in the media, so if you want to take a closer look uh, to them. Uh, there was an interesting episode with the Arctic Road during the migration crisis in 2015 and 2016. 
Uh, as you may know, 2015, Europe experienced an unprecedented peak of asylum seekers and migrants uh, entering the continent. And it was over 1 million asylum seekers and about 70,000 uh, of them even came up to the north. Uh, and they mainly came then from Sweden to Finland. But there was an awkward episode that happened in the northern Finland and some of the asylum seekers and migrants started to enter Finland from Russian border. And that border is extremely um, uh, well, uh, uh, it's, it's not like you could walk over the border as such. There are checkpoints and, and they certainly check who is, who is coming. And uh, uh, the volume of the whole immigration crisis, of course, came as a surprise, but then we clearly weren't prepared or expected that there would be someone coming from Russia's side as well. So this raised a little bit eyebrows at what is happening and, and why and who are, they people, who are these people entering Finland and, and what's going on. So, so there were probably some elements of uh, hybrid uh, uh, tactics behind that. And uh, the European officials, of course, it was all of a sudden a lot of people entering the continent and then in uh, Finland as well. They really needed to put places, policies and, and even like the places where, where the people can uh, sleep and so on so it was a lot of hassle in in those couple of months and um, of course then there were little fears not necessarily little that what if the Russia would allow much more people to enter the country and uh, what would happen then and why would, would why would they do that and if they would allow a lot of people would it cause some kind of a panic then the other uh, uh, one that has been uh, uh, quite a popular news story in Russian media has been uh, something about the child custody cases. As, as I mentioned that Finland is a very small country and, and we have a very solid foundation and, and the uh, population is only 5.5 uh, million so, uh, and we are ethnically homogeneous and politics, politics, they work over the aisle, so, so there's not like this kind of like uh, animosities with, inside the country. Uh, of course, some cracks and, and fractions, but, but not like big ones. Uh, so it seemed that, that there was a meaning to uh, attack this uh, national narrative with an alternative narrative. And uh, these stories to started to roll that, that uh, the Finnish uh, social service officials are taking the Russian kids away from their parents and, and so on. Uh, well, that uh, hasn't, has been a little bit more uh, something that we haven't heard uh, very recently, but uh, as, as the nature of these threats or tactics is that it, they always evolve and something else might come up as well. So I'll stop uh, on that to, to give uh, my turn to the, to the next, next Cr speaker. Krista, thank, thank you. you. And um, you know, your points too in terms of the excellence of Finnish education yeah. and sort of identity um, as sort of um, a, a prophylactic in some ways, you know, a point well taken. Um, Brian, as I mentioned, he's a defense editor for Politico. Um, he also teaches at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University and is the author of the book, You Are Not Forgotten. Brian, please. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so I thought where I could maybe add some value is just take a little bit of a step back. Um, and number one, just talk about, at least from the perspective of the American media, the sheer enormity of this problem. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, the multiple sources of information, the advent of the internet age has completely changed the landscape. I mean, it, it doesn't even remotely resemble what it used to be. And I think 
Uh, we'd all agree that because of uh, this decentralization of information sources, uh, the ability to be discerning, to have confidence that what you're reading is true or not true, is, is uh, extremely difficult. It's almost a full-time job, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, the, the cost of entry, if you wanted to provide information to the masses, used to be a pretty high bar. Uh, you needed a printing press, you needed barrels of ink, or a radio tower, or a television transmission tower. And now, I mean, you literally can be in your underwear, in your basement, in front of a computer, and if you do it the right way, you could get out information that can move markets, uh, can inflame social tensions, um, and you know, possibly even start wars. And as all of the experts here have said, clearly there are nation states that are aware of that. And, and I'm not even sure that they realize how explosive potentially it is um, if the right sort of perfect storm uh, came to be. So uh, what else has changed? Um, I think you can't talk about this issue without talking about Donald Trump, at least from the American perspective. I mean, on top of this phenomenon, you have a president who has basically made a living out of dismissing and criticizing the news media as not credible, as a bunch of liars. Um, and I think that kind of rhetoric has, is vastly complicated, this already complicated problem of what is true out there that I'm reading, what isn't. And I think uh, when talking about President Trump, you also have to sort of define this term fake news, because I think it's a lot of people have different definitions for it. The way I see it is there's basically two, two definitions. One is the real definition, which we're talking about here, which is news uh, that is misinformation, that is purposely developed to push an agenda, to change minds, to affect the way people think. And then, of course, there's the fake news term that the president and some of his supporters always use, which is just news they don't like or, or news that they think is negative but doesn't necessarily mean, in fact, in most cases, it doesn't mean that it's not true or it's not somewhat accurate. Um, uh, also what's changed, I mean, in the midst of all this, I looked up some figures because I think it's interesting. I was kind of surprised. Uh, a recent paper from the Pew Research Center showed that 67% of Americans get at least some of their news from social media. That's a huge amount. And we know that you know, if you're lucky, half the stuff you're looking at on social media is, is not verified or is not true or, or certainly has lots and lots of questions about its veracity. Um, the research also showed that the less educated Americans are, the more they rely on social news for their news information, um, which uh, also su surprised me. I mean, that... Uh, uh, you have this sort of sector of the population that is enormously reliant on what they're reading on Facebook or, or Twitter or other social media sites. Um, but the good news in the poll, or in the research that Pew did, uh, was that I think two-thirds of Americans said that they're very distrustful of social media in terms of their uh, news judgment. They don't think a lot of what they're reading which is sort of uh, encouraging, I guess, because they're getting their news there, but at least they sort of realize that it might not be true. And it's maybe more for entertainment value. Um, what hasn't changed? I think this is important, and I, uh, we talk about this uh, at the journalism school a lot at ASU. Um, this idea of, of using the news media for misinformation or, or using you know, the ability to to get information out to, to wide numbers of people for nefarious purposes is not new. I mean, in fact, it's almost an American invention, people could argue. I mean, if you think back to yellow journalism, you think back to the 19th century in this country where virtually every newspaper was the political arm of some machine. Reporters were on the payroll in many cases. Um, I think sort of what changed in the, in the 20th century, maybe in the 1920s and the 1930s, 
journalism in the United States kind of became much more professionalized and journalists got together and created more rules. Um, but it's really striking if you go back and read the New York Times in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, it's basically rewriting press releases. It's whatever the government said. I mean, if you look at the front page, it was 15 stories of what the U.S. government says it's doing, how it's doing it, and no critical sort of analysis, really. That changed when I think, uh, certainly in the 1960s, uh, the Vietnam War, I think, uh, led a lot of reporters to feel like they were, they had a job to sort of question the government. Um, the network newscasts before the advent of cable news, before the internet, I think also was a phenomenon over the course of three or four decades where you had three or four channels. Everybody watched it at the dinner table and the newscasters really felt a responsibility to kind of call it down the middle and not be too far this way, too far that way. So, you know, the, this sort of free for all that we have now, I wonder if it's just sort of kind of coming back to our roots in some ways. I mean, it's not, it's not vastly different. Um, I'll close maybe with just with a couple of thoughts on sort of what to do about it. I mean, I think the one thing that we have seen is an enormous amount of fact-checking websites and organizations. I mean, I, I think I saw a figure recently that they've quadrupled worldwide just in the last couple of years. Um, I think that's a sign that the news media, not just in the United States, but worldwide, feels uh, compelled to try and correct the record when there's so much misinformation out there. Um, I also think uh, it's important and someone touched on this earlier. Uh, I think Roman did, but sort of uh, in the Russia context, but sort of educating the public through public schools, through other means of why objective or factual news is so important to a democracy. I mean, it's sort of the secret sauce in some ways. How, how, how do you become an informed citizen if all you're reading is BS? And, um, not a lot of people in my business agree with me, but the, the, the last thing I would say is I, I think the media needs to start having disinformation beats. I think people in the major news media need reporters whose job is to cover disinformation because I think it's gotten so broad internationally and, and is such a problem that it needs to be called out virtually on a regular basis every day, not just here and there, hey, let's shoot down that story but somebody who writes about the phenomenon. And it's actually something in Politico we've been talking about doing, having somebody dedicated to, to doing that. So with that, I'll Brian, thank I'll you. Stop. You really touch on a lot of issues building, you know, across from where the panel has been on this. Um, my own perspective is, you know, blogging is not journalism. Um, you know, journalism and branded sources of information, whether you're take as Politico or Wall Street Journal, USA Today, New York Times, whatever, there's editorial reviews, there's, you know, there's standards. Um, and I think that's also a challenge for us today is we have lost the distinction in a lot of people's mind. Um, Chris, Chris Marsh, he's the Director of Strategic Research um, at the Joint Special Operations University. I did not know SOCOM had a university, but I learned something new every day. Um, his focus is on Russian Special Operations Forces, um, including um, strategy, Russian soft strategy, um, and, and policy issues. And he's also the editor of the Special Operations Journal. Um, he has a PhD in political science from University of Connecticut. In addition, he's also completed um, graduate study at Moscow State University, so he brings a lot of perspective to us, so thank you. Thank you. Um, like Roman, I have to caveat my remarks with the fact that these are my views only and not of the Department of Defense, nor of the United States Special Operations Command or the Joint Special Operations University. I'll just go ahead and begin um, that caveat out of the way. <laughs> Today we have discussed a wide range of malign activities emanating from Russia, from election interference to the manipulation of social media. One question that remains, however, is whether or not these activities are part of an overarching national grand strategy or if Russian President Vladimir Putin is merely reacting to international events in a haphazard way, simply taking advantage of opportunities as they are presented to him by the international system. If he does have an overarching strategy, what key interests 
and are driving this strategy? And finally, what threat does Russia pose to vital U.S. national interests? I believe the evidence supports the position that Putin is in fact a strategist, a serious one, and that he has a grand strategy for Russia and indeed the world. The problem in identifying it as such is that it seems strange and counter to the Western way of thinking. While Putin may in fact react to opportunities as they are presented to him, these lines of effort combine into a coherent global foreign policy agenda that seeks to reposition Russia as a great power, Dejava, in the emerging world order and to weaken the United States where it can, including through the destabilization of our democratic political system. Just what is this vision of Russia's place in the world and its relationship with its neighbors? I believe it's one in which Moscow is one of several centers of power, perhaps a, as U.S. hegemony gives way to, if not a multipolar world order, perhaps even a Chinese-centric world. It is a world in which Russia is perhaps distant from European values, but not so distant from European economic and political processes and institutions. In this world, Eastern as well as Western Europe are forced to play nice with Russia as a major energy source and a political and military power. The same holds true for East Asia, particularly China. While Russia is not about to copy a Chinese model of economic or political de development, it does seek to position itself in such a way as to embrace China in an alliance, one in which Moscow can maintain a position of sovereignty and independence as its eastern flank becomes home to the world's largest economy, most populous state, and perhaps the next global hegemon. Where does this leave Russia vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Russia is likely to counter the U.S. where it can do so at an acceptable cost, as Putin weighs the punitive damages associated with its actions, for instance in Ukraine or meddling in U.S. elections, against the advancement of its foreign policy agenda. Moscow will seek to counter U.S. actions simply because it resents American global hegemony, and it can do, do so because the U.S. political system's dysfunctionality by design of the Founding Fathers to hamstring government the government that governs least governs best, right, tempers its response while its alliance system, too, leads to the imposition of costs that do not outweigh the benefit of Moscow's perceived gains. In response to Russia being named as a target in the Pentagon's 2018 national defense strategy, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated that he, quote, regrets that instead of having a normal dialogue, the U.S. seeks to prove its leadership through such confrontational concepts end quote, and stressed that Russia is still, quote, quote, ready for dialogue. Despite, despite such proclamations, Russia has no real interest in a reset in Russia-U.S. relations in the near term. In fact, it welcomes and seeks to contribute to the weakening of the American political system and the relative decline of Washington's influence in the world. Indeed, it seeks to further such decline as its interference in U.S. affairs so cogently outlined here today makes clear. Along with Beijing, Moscow seeks a multipolar world in which U.S. hegemony comes to an end. This common ideal of a multipolar world has played a significant role in the rapprochement between Russia and China. As Grigory Karasin put it more than 20 years ago during the Yeltsin period, the support of the two great powers for a multipolar world was particularly important at that time when the international community still faced the inertia of the way of thinking that characterized the Cold War, claims to exclusive leadership and attempts to reduce the development of international relations to unipolarity. This is even more so the case today, some 20 years later, when Russia has recovered significantly from the post-Soviet glut it found itself in during the 1990s, while China has continued to grow steadily, both militarily and economically. Russia and China were explicitly mentioned in the 2018 National Defense Strategy as the great powers with which the U.S. is in competition. Both Russia and China have come a long way since the 1990s, and the friendship that emerged in the immediate post-Tiananmen period and continue to grow over the years now today appears to be one of the strongest bilateral alliances on the planet. Not only does the alliance provide each country with a secure rear flank, technology transfers and weapon sales support each other's military industrial complexes and military modernization of each state. While Russia is still ahead of China in certain areas, including maritime, aviation, and super hypersonic weapon systems, the Kremlin knows this edge will likely to give way in the next 10 to 20 years, as China emerges as the more advanced and powerful of the pair. Hence, the focus of Acting Secretary of Defense Patrick Shanahan, quote, quote, on China, 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 for all indications are that in the long term, China will dwarf Russian military power 
and present the greatest threat to U.S. interests and national security. Together, Russia's tentacles on its former Soviet neighbors and Moscow's strategic alliance with Beijing in pursuit of a multipolar world form the two main pillars upon which Putin's grand strategy rests. All other aspects of its foreign policy behavior can be traced back to this dual-pronged grand strategy. As the National Defense Strategy puts it, quote, Russia seeks, to ve seeks veto authority over nations on its periphery in terms of their governmental, economic, and diplomatic decisions to shatter the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and change European and Middle East security and economic structures to its favor. Thus, in a nutshell, are the objectives of Russia's grand strategy. All of Moscow's machinations, both foreign and domestic, from clamping down on civil liberties at home to meddling in Venezuela's revolution abroad, are all in support of these larger strategic objectives. The enduring national interest of the United States are the support of freedom, liberty, and free markets around the globe. Our friends and allies figure prominently here, as well as, as we ally with other democracies and regimes that share our values. Such was the justification for the expansion of NATO, especially as articulated by President Bill Clinton at the time. He also stated in regard to NATO expansion that European security was a vital U.S. national interest pointing to the two world wars as examples of what happens when nations go to war with each other. 20 years after the first wave of NATO expansion, the same can be said of our NATO partners, all fledgling free market democracies making progress at various paces. Russia's actions in Georgia and Ukraine have made known to the world that it does not consider the borders of European states as sacrosanct, which is seen by the U.S. as a critical component of the international system. Russia thus presents a challenge to these interests, not only in Europe, but all along its border, especially <clears throat> along the countries with which it has significant pockets of Russian speakers, as was mentioned today, including Kazakhstan, Estonia, and Latvia. Whether NATO members or not, Russian aggression and recidivism run counter to U.S. national interests, and the U.S. is compelled to counter this aggression where it can. The problem here is that Russia has a propensity to act in the gray zone between war and peace, where they can deny involvement and quite often get away with actions that violate international norms, if not actually international law. As we look to the future and try to anticipate it, we must focus on Russia's gray zone activities and how they may counter vital U.S. national interests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really... Um you know, really helpful, especially take your point about um, Putin's not day trading. There's strategy behind what he's doing, which makes it more of a challenge for other nations. Today. Absolutely. Um, we have approximately 10 minutes before we'll be going to closing, closing remarks, and I want to open the floor to questions, and we'll take uh, several questions at once. Uh, my name is Rachel Van Horn. I work for the National Endowment for Democracy. I think the lens of a lot of the analysis that you guys are presenting comes from nefarious activity in Russia that's being exported to the Western world. And I get that because that's kind of the theme of this panel. But I'm wondering if you guys have thought at all about nefarious Russian activity to increase its authoritarian control within the country, especially on the internet, and the idea of the Russian sovereign internet. Um, and so far as all kind of Russian in independent media outlets, uh, Russian civil society activism is engendered by a free internet. I'm wondering if this issue is talked about in, in the technology sector, in the technology world, um, also in the halls of the Defense Department. I'd like to hear more, thanks. Question over here. Yeah, Brian, you mentioned that not a lot of people in the journalism industry seem to be in favor of more fact checking. Uh, and making that a part of their <coughs> journalism. I'm just curious if you could expand on that. Why not? What's the... Other questions? Question over here. I have a question for Roman Piatkov and Chris Marsh uh, regarding the different dimensions of uh, um, Russian influence in the security policy of allies uh, in Europe uh, and, el and elsewhere. Um, and a little bit provocative question. Um, on our side, we look at we look at the Russian influence as partners in crime. Do you try in your work, in your assessment, to also look for how 
you know, countries in Europe have been facilitating this Russian influence. You know, they have been complicit in expanding that. So it's not only Russia, it's also internal problems within this country. I know we have a question in the back. Thank you, John Luff, uh, Chatham House. Um, really, just a, a slight comment on what um, Chris Marsh has been saying. I, I dispute slightly the idea that there is a grand strategy um, emanating from the Kremlin. There's certainly a strategy. And I, I make the distinction because I think a grand, grand strategy relates very clearly means to ends. And the people running Russia at the moment are actually a, a little bit short on certain capabilities when it comes to, in fact, running their own country properly, developing, um, sustaining long-term growth of the economy, um, a very severe dependence on hydrocarbons, that sort of thing. There are all sorts of areas of weakness there. Now, what I think they've been very clever at doing is working out where our weaknesses are and where they can push us and achieve certain outcomes, which they're doing rather effectively. But the trouble is we haven't taken enough time or put, devoted enough effort to studying their weaknesses, which are very substantial. So I would be careful about maybe over-exaggerating the, the vision and, in fact, what, uh, what underpins it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Andrew's gotten off way too easy. Um, I'll throw one question at him then. Just in terms of the relationship uh, between the tech sector and governments, um, in terms of where you're able to find alignment and where sort of the the multinational business interest diverges um, in terms of areas of cooperation. If, if you see trends moving one direction or another, that would be helpful. So I'll just open it up now to our panelists to respond to questions. Um, well, I could certainly take the fact-checking question. Maybe I, I misspoke or I wasn't clear, but I actually think a lot of news organizations are taking it more seriously. Um, I cited uh, the fact, I think it's Duke University recently did a study that showed that fact-checking websites, many of which are connected in some form to a news organization, have grown exponentially in the US, uh, in Ukraine, in Asia, and, you know, in lots of different places. So I think there is a recognition that um, fact-checking needs to be much more of a focus. As I said, I think it needs we need to step it up even more. I mean, there's, uh, there's no doubt that um, we're not doing enough. Uh, and then maybe I would just say quickly on the first question about stifling democracy inside Russia it makes me think of, of, of something that I think sometimes gets lost in this debate about Russia's uh, malign activities and what we're doing and what we're not doing about it. Um, if you talk to people in the Pentagon, and elsewhere in the national security bureaucracy, I, you know, you can't divorce the U.S.-Russian relationship and what they do versus what we do in response without, you know, remembering because we know all this that they have an enormous nuclear arsenal that could destroy the United States. It's the only country that can do that, and I think it it it's not front and center when we're talking about it, but when the bureaucracy is trying to figure out what to do about it. There is sort of this reluctance to push too far because, you know, you talk to some intelligence people who cover Russia who will say, as the gentleman kind of alluded to, that Russia could be teetering on the verge of collapse and we don't even know it. I mean, you know, um, and so, so I, I think what goes on inside Russia is, I mean, at least from my perspective, it's very opaque. Um, you hear all these pronouncements, but you wonder, like, is, there, is that really true? I mean, does Putin really have control? Um, and and it, the more he tries to maintain control, is that because he's losing control? Other panelists want to respond to questions? Uh, I, was, I can respond to the, so you were asking about different dimensions of Russian military influence in Europe, was that the, my... And whether you, you're also focusing on the internal problems Yeah. So, I mean, of course, I think you'll, uh, from where Russia has been, it's probably the allies that still use Russian equipment are, of course, more susceptible to that uh, just through the uh, 
just through the nature of that and the requirements for the Russian uh, you know, support for some of those things uh, through the spare parts, whether it's spare parts or whether it's uh, actual um, uh, new equipment. But from and in that perspective, uh, I, would, I mean, there's definitely recognition that that is uh, a venue for Russian uh, activity. And I think recently it was Croatia uh, purchasing uh, U.S. equipment versus getting rid of some of the Russian equipment, and I think a few other countries. So I think it's a, definitely a uh, recognition of it. I think there's a, um, like it, it would be a long-term process to change it out because uh, those countries do rely on that equipment and the U.S. Uh, uh, equipment, while uh, better, is not as uh, maybe affordable to some nations without specific support from uh, either U.S. or other organizations. From the security perspective, I mean, um, NATO is our main security uh, instrument there in Europe, and then we, uh, through NATO, I mean, that's our uh, our ability to influence other countries or to uh, make uh, to see them or to align them more with Western world. I mean, that's how we do. I mean, that's the expansion of NATO was kind of along one of those things. Most, uh, if you, uh, you kind of look back and. Uh, a uh, couple of decades. So I mean, there, there is a there's a way for. I mean, there's a uh, way. There's a way forward. I mean, it's not easy and it's not quick. And uh, but there's a recognition of things Russia does. And you can see we the recent Turkey discussion or the S400 that's right now in the news. I mean, the United States has laid out a clear uh, uh, consequences of what's going to happen if that sale goes through. And uh, I mean, uh, and so far, I mean, it's that's exactly what's been happening. In this relationship. Just, I wonder, did you have anything you learned to say from a Finnish perspective of kind of the dark kind of perspective you see elsewhere um, in terms of Russian activities, whether you sort of have a different vantage that you look at it from? Uh, one thing I wonder uh, when someone was mentioning that uh, your partners in crime that um, that uh, it's it's a um, slippery slope if we start to use the same dirty tricks and mm -hmm. as the the the, uh, the other one because uh, we, weren't we supposed to uh, protect the core values of democracy and and like that things go by by the law and and the legality of, of everything. That, that was just uh, one of the observations that I think that we should always talk about the core values and be, play by that book uh, and, and build on that on our defense. Andrew? Yes, please. Um, so I'll try to address both your uh, question, Todd, and the one about the domestic situation in Russia um, simultaneously. If I can, I'll just take a slight angle on it. Um, so first of all, I won't try to um, uh, answer question, Todd, or speak for Google, um, rather, but I think broadly the Google and, and the tech industry's um, perspective on this question of um, how do we balance um, the issues of uh, freedom with entering markets that uh, might be um, advantageous from a business perspective. The broad perspective on that is that um, enabling citizens who live in repressive regimes more access to information is fundamentally a good thing. That's fundamentally a signal of progress. The challenge there becomes, and this is particularly acute, I think, right now in the Russian domestic situation and also in many other repressive regimes around the world, is that access to the free and open internet and Google services or any a number of other tech platform services or the internet more broadly is routinely being blocked or filtered in some specific way, and so the citizens are not able to um, access the free and open internet, or certainly not the free and open internet that we um, uh, envision. So what that means in practice kind of for, for Jigsaw, for my organization, is that we're fighting that every single day and we're on the front lines of that fight to um, get people, to keep people online and then give them tools to bypass those, those forms of state censorship. For instance, we have a product called Outline that enables um, individuals or organizations access to a secure and private VPN service that can get around uh, most types of state filters that um, are uh, that exist in various types of repressive regimes. Um, on the disinformation side as well, um, of course that's happening domestically, not only in the Russian context, but in many other contexts around the world. Um, disinformation tends to get 
um, an outsized focus uh, uh, when it's in a cross-border context, for instance, Russia attacking the United States or Great Britain or so forth. But there's increasing evidence that around the world, repressive regimes and others are using this, uh, domestic, these types of tactics domestic, domestically on their own populations um, to include in Russia. So I think those types of things are things that we need to be increasingly concerned about and not only worry about when they're attacking our citizens or other citizens in the West, but they're also being used domestically as a tool, another tool of oppression. Um, we need to be fighting that as well. I think we're three for three for... Do I get a chance oh, to respond? Sorry, sorry, yes, of course. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Sorry, no. <laughs> uh, the first question, um, speaking on behalf of United States Special Operations Command, there's deep interest in the domestic situation, civil society, and the regime stability in Russia. Um, that's about all I can say, but that there is deep there is deep interest in analysis that's going on on, on that topic. Uh, the question regarding um, the uh, our allies in Eastern Europe, we're quite aware, especially within the soft community, special operations forces community, that the allegiance and loyalty of some of the people we're working with is up to question. Um, we saw that in Ukraine where when the invasion took place, people dropped their weapons and ripped off their shoulder patches and, and aligned with the Russian forces in Crimea. Um, so we know that. We also, I'll, I'll stop there, I'll stop there. So, so we're, we're keenly aware of, of, of that. Um, and then finally with grand strategy, um, in the book project that I'm working on, I define now what, what is a grand strategy. And, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that I think there's an alignment between theater strategies and a global agenda. And that's how I go about the, the idea of what a grand strategy is. It's, there's no ideological basis to it, but there is an overarching um, strategy in my belief that ties together the threads of, of, a, of a strategy and that these are not haphazard actions that are taken just because they can, um, the means, but that these means are aimed towards a specific end. So I'll stop there, Todd. Thank you, and um, please join me in thanking this panel, and then we'll be going straight to closing remarks. Yeah, please, please stay. You have, you have earned that seat at the table. Uh, Dr. Miriam Lanskoy, she is the, a senior director, um, the senior director for Russia and Eurasia at NED. And she's going to join us now to make some closing remarks. She's um, spent the past 14 years um, with experience in political analysis and democracy promotion in post-Soviet Eurasia. In 2005, um, became a term member of Council on Foreign Relations. She's published widely, um, too many to list here. Um, and, you know, in a personal side, I'm a huge fan of what NED does, recipient of some grants from NED, which makes me, you know, even more appreciative. So please, um, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Great, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to start with uh, just saying how impressed I am by the Free Russia Foundation and by Natalia Arnaud and all of her colleagues. Um, they do amazing work. And Natalia herself um, had to flee Russia, and literally at gunpoint. Uh, she's had a tough um, time. And it's because of her work with civil society and promoting democracy in Russia. Uh, this is a small organization. Most of the staff are volunteers. They've come here recently. Uh, they're in a foreign place using a foreign language, and they've been so remarkably, incredibly effective. Uh, think what they could do if they could do this work at home, if they could fully and freely realize their potential. Um, a Free Russia Foundation is an incredible, it's an embassy of Russian civil society, all of it. Uh, journalists, human rights activists, academics, politicians. They bring them here, they give them ability to work, they give them ability to inform our expert and policy and news community, and they can bring all of us together and they do an amazing, amazing work. 
Um, if Russian state became accountable to people like this, we would not need to spend so much time chasing Russian malign activities all over the world. Um, there are a lot of people in Russia who are struggling to make it a democracy, one that would behave itself entirely differently on the international um, stage. Um, and what happens to them? They get forced out, they get uh, branded foreign agents, undesirables, uh, they get thrown in prison, there are cases manufactured around them, there's a horrible, there's a series of terrible cases now against um, open Russia and uh, you just, I won't get too much into it, but there are political prisoners, uh, arbitrary arrests, detentions, um, the media is controlled except for the part that is on the internet. And with all of the machinery of repression, um, still the civil society is remarkably vibrant and effective. What we're seeing, um, uh, for instance, and we're seeing society change. When did uh, Putin put his worst laws into place? In 2012, in response to the protests and the civil mobilization that we saw from 2010 to 2012. So Russia's aggression abroad is very much related to suppressing democracy at home. Um, Russia's changing, we're seeing pockets of this change. Just this weekend, uh, Xi and Putin were having a summit in St. Petersburg and no one was paying any attention uh, because uh, a Russian journalist had been, uh, there were drugs planted on him, he was unfairly uh, imprisoned. And that took over the agenda completely. And it turned out that Russian civil society could mobilize. Uh, a lot of media spoke out, a lot of prominent people spoke out. Amazingly, charges were dropped um, and he was freed a few days later. Um, what is significant? After he was freed, after Medusa, the, the, the media he works for, um, said, we're done, stop protesting. After that, 500 people were arrested in Moscow uh, protesting. But what were they shouting now? They weren't saying free Ivan. They were saying end police terror. We're seeing more and more um, specific topical issue-based protests grow broader and not um, uh, not necessarily following a particular leader. We saw that in Yekaterinburg, we saw that in Gushetia, we're seeing all kinds of social protests. So essentially what I would say is com what we're seeing now is a return of what we saw in 2011, 2012. It's been somewhat, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a new generation, it's a new social class. It's a much more assertive uh, civil society. Uh, it depends on the internet um, as an organizing force and for the publications. The only place where there's uh, media freedom is YouTube and social media, other, other kinds of social media. Um, for that reason, because the Russian model is so different from the Chinese, the Russian internet has been relatively free up until now. For that reason, you're getting a, um, now a, um, uh, uh, laws and technical measures like reducing the number of cables to try to uh, control the internet in Russia. To my mind, it's literally a race. Will society change more quickly? Will these pockets of civil society and people really trying to bring about more accountability, more freedom, can that, will that grow? more quickly or will the internet be put under control first? And that, that is the big question uh, kind of hanging, hanging in the air. Um, will these processes have enough time uh, before uh, the internet can be really um, uh, brought under uh, a, a lot of control? 
Um, what what can we do? Um, I think there's already you know a lot that has been said about uh, working with allies and working in Europe. Um, uh, there there's collaboration among civil society. There's working on resilience and awareness and so forth. Um, but again, I would say that campaigning for a free, free, open, secure internet in Russia, preventing um, that kind of control from, from taking hold should be a big priority. And the other one is supporting, supporting the uh, Russian civil society inside. So thank you, and thank you so much, Natalia. David Kramer, the Honorable David Kramer, he has dedicated his professional life to promotion of democracy and human rights. Um, he, he's the chair of the board for the Free Russia Foundation. He is a senior fellow at the Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy at Florida International University. He was recently the McCain Institute um, for International Relations Leadership. He, sorry, he was with the McCain Institute, where he was the Senior Director for Human Rights and Democracy. He remains an affiliated Senior Fellow at the Institute. Previously, he has served, he served for four years as President of Freedom House. Prior to that, he was a Senior Transatlantic Fellow at the German Marshall Fund. And Mr. Kramer, now we go back to the Honorable Mr. Kramer, he served for eight years at the Department of State during the um, George W. Bush Administration, um, including as the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, David, we're, we're thrilled you're here and look forward to your closing remarks. Thanks. Thanks. Um, first, let me just say, let's give Todd a round of applause for a terrific job of moderating. Very well done. Um, let me just mention a few quick things before I wrap up and uh, thank the, the organizers. Um, one is a reminder of something Congressman Keating said earlier today, and that is I think when we talk about this issue, it is important to be careful about our diction, if you will. It is important to distinguish between Russia, the Russian people, the Russian nation, and the Putin regime, the Kremlin, and Russian authorities. And I think the problem we have are with the second category, not with the first. We actually don't, we are not enemies with the Russian people. We don't have a problem with the nation. Um, I think we have enormous problems and challenges and threats coming from the Kremlin, from the current Russian leadership. And so it's just a reminder that I think, and, and I slip into this uh, pattern as well, that just to be a little careful because there are many Russians, including some of them here in this room today, but also in Russia itself today, who are struggling for a better future for their country, and let's not alienate them by being a little um, sloppy with our, with our language. Second, I've said many times before that Putin's greatest export is corruption. But in order to export it, we import it. So shame on us for not cleaning up our own house, for not promoting transparency, for not demanding better from our lawyers, our financial firms, from real estate agents, uh, from everybody across the board, from lobbying firms and others. Um, we allow this to happen. And what we see unfold is Putin and its Kremlin propagandists demonize the West. They accuse us of being the threat. And yet they turn to us, as someone, as a number of panelists earlier said, to store their ill-gotten gains here because they have much more confidence in our system and rule of law than they do in anything back home. And so we need to recognize that our openness, which is something we should treasure and protect with everything we have, is something that also needs a little safeguard every now and then. And we need to do a much better job of cleaning up our own house. Last point is um, picking up on what Miriam said in the question over here. Um, we shouldn't be shocked that a regime that represses its own population, that throws journalists in jail with planted drugs and kills opposition leaders and drives out civil society activists from the country, poisons others, stages of fraudulent elections, interferes in other countries. We shouldn't be shocked that a country that doesn't respect, or a, a government that doesn't respect its own people's human rights and basic freedoms will not respect the human rights and freedoms and concepts of sovereignty and territorial integrity 
in other places. The nature of regimes matters enormously. And at the root of this problem, whether it's disinformation or corruption or kinetic activity, whatever it is that you want to talk about, it comes back to the root of the Putin regime. We have differences and disagreements with the UK, with France, with Germany, with Japan and others. We don't have fundamental existential disagreements with those governments or, or with the people in those countries. We, we do have an enormous challenge and threat coming from Moscow in the nature of, of the Putin regime. President Trump, I think, gets it constantly wrong when he says rhetorically, wouldn't it be great if we and Russia got along? The answer to that question is, of course, it would be wonderful. I don't know anybody who would be opposed to that. It's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, can we and Russia get along as long as the Putin regime is in power without our sacrificing our values, our interests, and other countries in the process? And the answer to that question, unfortunately, is no, we can't. And so we need to come to grips with that realization and that recognition before we sacrifice many things that are near and dear to us. So lastly, um, congratulations, Natalia, on this report, and congratulations to members of this panel and previous panels for contributing not only to a, a terrific report, but a fascinating day of, of discussion um, on, on these issues. Uh, none of this would have been possible without uh, Natalia and Free Russia Foundation. Um, everything Miriam said is absolutely true. I have the great honor and privilege of serving as chair of the Free Russia Foundation board. Uh, Melissa Hooper uh, is also on the board. Ellen Bork was here earlier. My thanks to them for coming. Um, it is an amazing organization. Um, and I understand and very much appreciate Henry Jackson Foundation's support for this effort, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, as, as well as uh, Human Rights First and partnering on this important initiative. Um, but I, I think it is really hard to say no to Natalia uh, <laughs> because she is such a compelling figure doing an enormously important and valuable work, not just for your home country, Russia, but for us here in the West and in the United States as well, to remind us of what we should be standing for, uh, which is a better future, not only for Russia, but for ourselves as well. Thank you all for coming again, Todd. Thank you for moderating all day, and have a good rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, again, we greatly appreciate it. I was told there's uh, caviar and bellinis, but then I was corrected because the foundation nixed that idea. So we're done. <laughs>